All right, welcome everyone to the Archon Team League Championships Week Five, Day Two. I'm Noxious. Uh, I'll be casting today alongside Trump, and we have for the first series of the day, we'll have Firebat joining us as a co-caster. How are you guys doing, Firebat? Uh, doing great. Glad to be here. Glad to be casting. Not really too experienced of a caster, but gonna give it a shot. <laughs> no, you're you're perfectly fine. I've seen you cast before, Trump. How are you doing? I'm looking forward to see whether or not Celestial will get their first win. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're actually at zero right now, right? So they've got yeah. a long way to climb back. Um, but so, go ahead. They're they're not like out of it yet. They still definitely need to somehow find their first win because if they're not able to put any points on the board and they get last, they're just out of the league completely. Whereas second to last, then they're that's the same thing as basically getting third because you yeah. still have a chance to come back to the grand championship at the end. Yeah, they can get uh, through the Redemption and then through the Satellite to maybe have a chance to go to the Live Finals. So, And I think they're going to be mathematically out of the league if they don't work on it. So we'll give you a quick recap video, guys, so we can maybe catch up in case you've missed some of the past matches before. The results from yesterday are not yet in the video, of course, since it was made prior to that. So keep that in mind. We'll be right back after the recap. If, if Life Coach had good cards here, uh, it would matter because then next turn he could go Jaraxxus Hellfire. That rope is ticking. This is this is a turn that requires much more time than that. I wonder if he got it. Oh no! Uh, it doesn't look like it. Other giant? He, he has he's like out of steam, and he has Hellfire Hellfire Healbot next turn. Oh wow! Oh. oh my God! The top decks are real. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, RD. This is a silly day. Yeah. This is crazy. So, this is just, I don't know. It's just so, lethal, right? I haven't countered. That looks like a lot. This, this uh, lineup is definitely very anti hazmark as we can see. Double Hunter's Mark. Double. Gar, I, th yeah. I think you ran Double Hunter's Mark last week, right? Uh, was it last week? No. Yeah, okay. uh, no, I played Chassis deck and it doesn't have Hunter's oh, okay. Mark. But this is a difficult turn. I would just totem up. You need spell power to him. Like if you get spell power totem, you have a pretty good chance to win. But you totem first, obviously. Before you flint him. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's definitely out of hand. Yeah, he has, he has also the coin, he's dead. He needs wow. like, no, he doesn't need anything. It's eight, eight yeah, he doesn't need. And what, just really surprising there. I and Life Coach actually surprised. surprised. <laughs> you know what's crazy? He looks very surprised about the burst damage. Yeah, what was he expecting? It's Mech Shaman. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, like, if you just think about, like, the line of plays, if... I think if Kibler actually played the Felt Reaver... Four damage, Chainlock's good at dealing three with Dark Bomb and Hellfire. But it's a lot harder to have Dark Bomb plus Coil. Whoa, Trump's excited about right. something. Okay. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Just doing that. That, is, that is way too exciting. Oh, he, he, I think he's saying, like, <laughs> turn two rope. How is he roping? Oh, like, yeah, if yeah, I can yeah, read well, his mouth move, it's like, why is he roping on turn two? He's like, what, has he never played life coach before? Well, that'll do it for the recap. So before we go any further, a quick shout out to Amazon for sponsoring the event. They're doing a giveaway for discount codes. You can check them out on tmarcon.com slash Amazon or alternatively go on amazon.com slash Hearthstone to get some info on the redemption. So it's easy, to, easy, easy, easy way to get uh, cheap card packs. Uh, now... The results have not been completely updated. We had some matches happening yesterday. Uh, Team Archon versus Value Town. I mean, you guys kind of played against each other. And we had Force and Boyers versus Nihilum as well. So Nihilum ended up winning, and Archon took the game versus Value Town. Um, that was, those were really good games yesterday, though. Uh, yeah, they're really they were enjoying all right. the play. <laughs> Sorry? I mean, did you like? Because we we had a few matches. I don't know if it was really like in your series. I think every everything went somewhat standard, um, but it wasn't the same for maybe all the matches that happened. We had some really crazy shredders happening all over the day yesterday. Those were like some of the most uh, meaningful 
I mean, drops that could have ever happened. Now we see the standings here. We have Nihilum still in first place after their win yesterday. Team Marcon caught up to second place. Uh, they're still kind of getting tailed by Value Town, so you guys aren't exactly too far away from each other. You have a good chance of just staying in the top uh, top four. Like going forward, uh, like how do you feel? Like because you you've got a pretty good lead, right, in terms of game wins over Team Liquid, the both of you. So. Do you think, going forward, the teams you still haven't fought, that's going to stay like this? Or uh, is anything going to change, Trump? Uh, there's still two more weeks, and I think that it could easily still be quite varied, since we are very close together. Yeah, I agree with what Trump's saying. Like, second place is really huge, because you get to skip the uh, satellite tournament, I think it's called, and just right. immediately advance to the grand finals, which is huge. And there's so many people that are extremely close to second place. And uh, Team Value Town kind of got hurt a lot yesterday when they only got three wins in their game. Because now, if Liquid's going to pull a win today, they're going to be uh, one win ahead of Value Town and be uh, one win behind Archon. And then Value Town's going to be kind of a little bit behind. But there's still two weeks and anything can happen. If any team like drops one game, or like one series, 6-5 even, yeah or 5-6, then they're just going to be out of that second place spot. Yeah, we're going to get to see the, the that match a little later. For the first match, we've got Team Celestial versus Cloud9. Obviously, you know, Tiddler is one of the best players in the world. We're going to have a little spotlight on him, and we'll be right back after that. Don't go anywhere. I Yachou 然后SS的话 谢谢所有Twitch上甚至海外所有喜欢我看我比赛的观众 All right, so that's it for the spotlight for Team Celestial's leader, Tiddler. One of the best players in, the, I guess, the entire scene at this point. Uh, he's got, you know, we mentioned that uh, more tournament winnings than any other player. And he's definitely, you know, a really good mind as far as Hearthstone goes. But his team hasn't been doing too well in the league so far. They haven't, they haven't gotten a single win as of yet. Yeah, they, they've been really struggling. And maybe one of the reasons for that is just because... The Chinese meta is so different than the NA meta, so they prepare their decks, they're playing on their Chinese ladder, and then they come over to the NA or EU scene, and they're just not teched the right way for the environment that they're being put into now. So yeah. that can be a disadvantage. Yeah, I can imagine if uh, you're going from one metagame to a completely different one. Now, Trump, like, you probably noticed Silent Storm's lineup right now. Um, I'd imagine you noticed Druid and Priest being a part of that lineup. There was no Rogue on Team Celestial's side. Uh, how do you feel about that? I mean, those are two sort of unusual classes, although Druid is coming back a bit. Yeah, it's kind of nice to have a oddball guy, especially in this team league <laughs> like Silent Storm, because they can bring, and they've played those two, like, decks that aren't very popular, but can play them well. Uh, I think in one of those preview videos, we saw Sunstorm hitting someone for the face for some, like, 26 or something with two light ones. So I am anxious to see that again. 
Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a very versatile player. I mean, the entire team from... Uh, I think Frozen Ice might be like the most specialized player from Celestial. Uh, he tends to favor the aggressive playstyle more so than his teammates who seem to play just about anything. Uh, so I, I wonder if we'll see the Hunter and Warlock from Frozen Ice being Zoo and maybe a hybrid slash face. He's brought a lot of that in the tournament so far. So we got Paladin versus Warrior for the first matchup. Yeah, Strifecore recently got really high ranked on uh, EU ladder <laughs> with a mid-range Paladin, which was surprising to me. So I expect to see uh -huh. that instead of the face. Yeah, you've had some experience with mid-range Paladin in this league. Do you think it's a very good deck to bring? <laughs> that that so seems like deck. a jab to it. Go ahead, <laughs> it's not a jab. I, was just... I did go, I think, uh, I did lose about four games with Paladin one of the weeks. And it's just because it is weak to a lot of the decks that some people are going to bring, uh, such as the Freeze Mage, the Oil Rogue, the Patrons, which unfortunately Strifecrow is up against. Um, however, like noted earlier, Celestial didn't bring a Rogue, so Paladin's a lot more of a valid choice. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think it uh, if it dodges Rogues, it's got maybe less poor matchups uh, overall. What were we going to say, Farbet? I was just going to say that Paladin is one of those classes that is does okay against everything, I feel. And I feel like this format, which allows you to bring six different classes, each player, each side does, uh, the specialized decks seem to thrive a lot more. Things like Freeze Mage that have really polarized matchups and can just guarantee a win because you know your opponent's going to have one of the decks that you can beat with it. Whereas Paladin's just kind of okay against the entire general field and can often like lead to some inconsistencies when it just doesn't. Uh, yeah. When it's going so, to what you're saying is everybody should be bringing six mil decks. What? <laughs> no, 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 no. Not that, not that. that was a really big draw <laughs> by Strifecraft. This is one of the few ways to win this matchup. Turn three, uh, yeah. Turn Mustard. three Muster into No Whirlwind, and then turn four Quartermaster, and it looks like Strifecraft might live the dream here. Tiddler's got two, two draws. Card draws. Could get, he could get it still. There's a good. There's a chance he could still even try for the shield block attempt. Yeah, but you're not going to shield block here. That is like. Yeah. You just try and like take the risk that they don't have it, I assume. Because, like, what are the chances, is what you're telling yourself. And then Strife Girl's going to have the punish. Yeah, even though this is living the dream from the Paladin side, uh, Patron Warrior still has a chance. It's going to be tough dealing with the. Oh, good oh, job by Hitler killing one of them. I was going to say it was going to be tough dealing with the 3 3 threes, but 2 3 threes, that's a little less bad. Yeah, I think you've got to be really scared of that play. It's one of the few tempo plays that happens uh, from Paladin's side. Like, it's one of the most common ones as well, you know, turn 3 muster into coin quartermaster. It's one of the, r the rare occurrences, I guess, where the coin is just invaluable in that specific case. Like, sometimes the coin will accelerate your curve a bit, but in this case, it's just a game-winning difference. Yeah, and Patron can oftentimes kind of struggle against mid-range decks like Druid sometimes when they get the Dream Start or even Paladin as we're seeing here when they get the Dream Start because all of that pressure so quickly is going to force uh, the Patron Warrior to use its removal and use its combo pieces inefficiently. Uh, it's an interesting Argus placement there. Yeah, I was going to say, was that a defend of Argus or, or what? All right, well. Yeah, he consciously thought about that trying to set up for Argus next turn. I wonder what's going through his head. Well, that can't be too bad. So this whirlwind effect is going to be pretty good. The thing is, if the Sword Hand Recruit gets buffed by one health again through the defense of Argus, that's going to make the whirlwind effect a little less impactful. Yeah, he's also going to be able to buff the uh, Quartermaster up from 5 mm -hmm. health to 6 health, so it doesn't die immediately to the Despite effect. Yeah. That was that's such good. a good placement. That hit. was actually a good placement. It's crazy. What's up? You kind of want to hit. Uh, both of the two attack guys to get it out of patron range if you're looking in the really long term though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you also want to hit the one health guy. Huh. Oh, yeah, I mean, in this case, like, I guess you could Go ahead. He's trying to set up the Argus placement, I guess, not to care about like the creation of patrons, but more to just apply as much pressure as possible, get a board that's going to stick nice along the immediate. Not maybe. Not. <laughs> Well, I guess ultimately you still can't attack the Quartermaster directly, so it doesn't matter. Like, it's not going to die right away to the uh, the death bite. And the fun thing is, he's still very far away from getting a Warsong Commander play with uh, the Grim Patrons. Yeah, as the Patron Warrior at 11 health, you got to feel not so yeah. good. 
That's a little awkward. I mean, you got shield block to help a bit. Double armor smith can help if you find a whirlwind, but you still need to have a board in the first place. Well, I mean, double armor smith in itself can be a board. So you double armor smith, kill a 3-3, three, three, and execute the 2-5? Or the 4-1? It's so awkward. I guess you don't really have the choice, right? I think it's actually fortunate for Tiddler that he had such a seemingly crummy draw with these armor smiths that are generally fairly useless, but they're going to allow him to just outlast Strife Crow's aggression a little bit, maybe stall into his patron combo, which could allow him to win. Oh, he's going to take the greedy execute here. He feels comfortable enough behind the shield block for heal to then just execute the highest health minion and let the 4-1 trade on board. He is very low on health. Like, that twist over champion is going to be a real big problem. Damage, if only for the damage output that it creates. Now, the question is, is Strife Crow going to deal with these armor smiths or just keep pushing for face and force his opponent to... Because you can't let those live if a whirlwind comes up and more minions are spawned. Yeah. I would almost like, say, like, a quality could be viable if he wants to go all in. Like, that is possibly something he could do. He could, like, a quality knife juggler, make a dude, have it juggle one of the armor smiths because he controls his RNG because he's a god, and then just peg <laughs> off the last armor smith with the lights justice and then push face. I think that's actually a really good point. That's, that seems like... Would you have done it through Rump, like, in this position? Like, is this a play you would have done most of the time, or...? I gotta admit, it's not something that I would do, but uh, it's okay. far more aggressive, and looks like it'll work out pretty well here. On the dead board. Tiddler, though, has not used any whirlwind effects besides a death bite, so he's still looking at possibly two ghouls and possibly two whirlwinds. Well, oh, definitely. There, it is. there we there go. Is. Here it starts. Yeah, this is not looking good now. He's going to be able to. Full Taskmaster, Inner Rage. That is, like, anything would completely wipe the board. In this case, I think Juggler will stick around, though. I, don't know, I guess if there's any good news for Strife Crow, it's that Tiddler's, well, it's just going to be that Strife Crow will lose all his uh, two and under attack guys. So you can't, Tiddler can't just force on Patron. In Tiddler's position, uh, I think it might be good to just play the Frothing Berserker before the Whirlwind just to have something to maybe try and contest the Knife Juggler. Or he might be thinking of a really greedy line right here, where he just death spites. Uh, that way he can next turn commander patron. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, is, that would be a greedy play. I mean, it, you would yeah. get a few patron spawns, but... I mean, your, your health would be too low, I think. Like, you're dead to weapon if you do that, right? Yeah. Oh. Double well, true that's silver's not... a bit clunky, but it is a lot of damage over... The course of a few turns without having to develop any board, and it's a decent amount of healing. Yeah, you play the shock it in here, you just go face with it. <laughs> no, 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 you can't, you can't leave a Brothic Berserker <laughs> up like that. Of course. I just uh, love the theoretical mid range paladin turning shock it in. Yeah. Now, do you even make a hero power here, or are you too afraid of patrons coming into play? Oh, he's Temple gonna take Aldor. the yeah, I like the Peacekeeper there. This is a good. good midway. There's nothing really to Peacekeeper against the opponent. Uh, that yeah, what's he going to patron here? actually a solid top deck. So he's going to set up the patrons for next turn, clear the board completely. I'm going to have to give the edge to patron here, even though he's only got limited cards in hand. Yeah, I agree with you. I think he's just on the verge of getting an, like, a, a board that Strike Roll simply can contest with. The problem is Sylvanas Windrunner could be an issue as well. Oh. That's a decent pickup. Yeah, the might be shifting now. So now, as Strife Crow here, he's got two different lines he's got to think about. Do you, does he just continue pressure with Sylvanas, or does he lay on hands and try and get into the Equality Consecrate combo? And I like keeping consistent with the game plan and just going complete pressure. Yeah, what if you just... Because the thing is, if you lay on hands here, you're really slowing down your aggression, and as a result, uh, there's a chance that you get, you're giving your opponent too much time. Like, there's no way he's going to get that much more armor at this point. You've seen two armor smiths, you've seen one shield block. He might have a second shield block at best. So his, you know, his only health gain here is going to be his hero power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a really good call for aggression. Um, Tiddler is looking to, I mean, he could armor up and kill that, but then he would die to two damage. So he's going to have to consider some really crummy lines here where he might have to get something stolen by Sylvanas. Oh, I don't like... 
uh, now he's gonna be dead in the second truth. So yeah, I kind of would have yeah. liked to see him go Warsong Patron and then just bounce off the one one and then swing face with the uh, Despite so then he can make two more Patrons and then he can just trade off the board. And then no matter what it takes, he has a Patron left over to trade in, so he can't die to anything. Wait, but Sylvanas would steal something with that one. Yeah, 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 but no matter what Sylvanas takes, he's unless it takes the he's other. Still active alive. Three it takes the yeah. It would have to take the three three that still has charge. So it's like a one in four, I think, at that point. Yeah, yeah, one in four. Um, that you yeah, don't fully clear the board. Well, Strife Crow takes it, so that's a victory for Midrange Pally over Patron. That's got to feel pretty good, though, because that wasn't a matchup, uh, I guess, you, you go into expecting to just take it. Um, but the pressure was really huge from the start. Yeah, definitely the, uh, the key thing there was having the muster get completely unanswered while still being able to hold the coin. And then being able to coin out that Quartermaster and just put huge amounts of pressure on for the rest of the game. It was huge. Tiddler got really close to stabilizing, but just couldn't get there. Yeah, yeah I really liked... Go ahead. What you just saw there was one of the rare times where the Paladin can actually take one on the Patron. Strife Crow went one, two, three, and then Coin Quartermaster. And on specifically three, Tiddler didn't have a whirlwind, so got unfortunate. He almost still came back, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Page, uh, Paladin's one of those decks that can win against basically anything if it gets the right curve going on. So it's definitely got that going for it in this format as it can have upwards of like a lot of tries. So it's not that bad of an off deck, and getting your off deck out of the way immediately has got to feel really good. I mean, I think ultimately, like, they're left with the five, as you said, you know, their best lineups at this point. Like, they've got their five favorite decks. Throwing that Paladin in first, uh, first try is probably what they wanted to do. Now, the question is whether or not their, their lineup is going to be able to hold against a Priest. Because, like, it sounds ridiculous, but well. Priest, like, it's got Rogue that's pretty much it's terrible against. Um, Freeze Mage, I assume. And patron. Is that that has to be patron from Kalento, or do you expect Control Warrior? You know, we were talking about this before we went live. But... Yeah, yeah. Control Warrior is possible to do very well in this format. We saw Trump play it and uh, had pretty good success with it. Locked up a 100% win against me. It felt pretty bad. <laughs> Q and Free Stage, where they know they have Control Warrior. And they're just right. like, well, I guess I lose. That was fun. Yeah. But uh, I, was, I was expecting you to concede like two minutes in. I, I, as oh. soon as the match started, I said, Firebass conceding this, like, two minutes in. But you actually went through the entire thing. Like, because, I guess, the Emperor Thorson really added to the uh, winning potential of the deck nowadays. Uh, back in the days, I guess, that would have been almost an auto-concede. Oh, Strifecrew wants to finish it up, and that's that may or may not be a good matchup. Yeah, I'd yeah. say bad, but... What do you I think, Firebass? Because I know you play a lot of Freeze Mage. Yeah. Freeze Mage can still win against Druid. The important thing is being able to get a Doomsayer off. So if Druid's not able to have a Keeper for your Doomsayer and your first Doomsayer gets off, I think the Mage is favored from that point onward. But uh, generally, Druid can handle Doomsayer very well with things like Swipe Wrath. Just kill it for 6 mana because you do Frost Nova Doomsayer on 5, and then Swipe Wrath is 6 mana, so they have that coming on their next turn. Or they can just Keeper it and deal with it that way. So Druid's a really, really tough matchup usually. But... yeah. Uh, if the, the mage is like some sort of tempo mage, then Druid is by far one of the easiest matchups. So I'll just have to see. I wonder if that new 2-drop they're going to get is going to turn that around. Like, I don't know how much they'll play it in Druid. The, you know, the conditional ramp where you could feed your tempo mage opponent uh, a death rattle, lose a mana crystal card. I wonder oh, if that's going to be so satisfying. <laughs> You're like, mere entity, all right, let's talk. Just take that. <laughs> yeah, well... Firepass not convinced. He's like that card. No. Yeah, I don't know. That card is uh, <laughs> it's good before like before turn five, just about. But like anytime after turn five, I feel like it's a uh, not so good investment. For I true. can see that because you're basically throwing a two three vanilla on the board at that point. Yeah, so it's only good the first five turns of the game, and any card that's only good for that limited amount of time just usually isn't that strong of a card. It is going to be Freeze Mage. Storm. Bad hand. Ugh. Yeah. Yo, oh, Ragnaros. The hand got a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, got a Fire Lord in it. Well, the thing is, like, it's, you, know, you know the game's going to last forever, so you're eventually going to be able to just put down yeah. that minion. and Because I think, you know, we are talking about that yesterday when Rag came up. It's like almost a, the key minion against Freeze Mage. And it's been coming back, like, everywhere. You see Ragnaros sprinkled in everywhere, Lothab everywhere, just because everybody expects their opponents to play Freeze Mage. Well, yeah, not only like that. There's a few different things. There's Freeze Mage, there's Oil Rogue, there's Handlock. Mm -hmm. Rag's uh, pretty good against all those decks. 
Yeah, and even Patron, Rag is pretty good against, as well as Lothab. So, like, in this format especially, Lothab and Rag are extremely strong. Well, it's gonna be a bit of a slow game. I mean, usually if the Druid can put down the early game pressure and rush down the mage, um, the game tends to just snowball pretty quickly, but this is not one of those games. And the, the Wild Growth is also one and off curve again. If it had been last turn, it would have been so much better because you could have played a five right now. But oh well, he'll, he'll well, live. some some consolidation. Cons ah. Consolation. Some very small good news for Zahn's term. Uh, wow. Otherwise, Look he would have scientist. turned two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that is. This is force and level hand. This is it. <laughs> this is so terrible. That is. Yeah, I was so busy looking at how bad Sandstorm's hand was, I didn't really notice how bad Strafkar's hand was, too. Yeah. I like the Sludge Belcher here over the Druid of the Claw. The Druid of the Claw has much more options later game, especially for, like, popping blocks and stuff like that, so... Yeah, because you can just charge it in with a Savage War, maybe late game, or just as an extra 4 damage to make sure you're weaving it perfectly at, like, 1 health left. Uh, that's one of those little uh, differences it makes. This is a bit awkward, though, for Strafkar. Like, this yeah. hand is just not something you ever want to play. If you get Emperor Thorson, it gets better. Because suddenly, you know, those secrets are going to be a little bit less of a pain to get off, but... Yeah. I mean, if Strafecrow is able to find a few more burn spells, this hand suddenly becomes extremely good. Because, I mean, the double ice block is going to allow him to have many volleys of burn spells already. And then the barriers, and he's got a board freeze already. He is definitely going to be able to last till turn 9 with a block still up and uh, could potentially be in a situation on turn 9 where he can't even be popped after Alexing, And then, just because Silent Storm's hand was so bad and he has so many secrets, so much stall, so much life gain. Yeah. Silent Storm's gonna be a little confused though. Like, Mad Scientist was played and two secrets were up. So he's either thinking there's a misplay or my opponent's hand is actually as horrible as it looks. Yeah. This Ragnaros is gonna really be the difference here and actually start putting on some real pressure. If Strife grows forced in a situation where he has to dump burn into the Ragnaros, then it's going to be really hard for him to win because his hand is such a way right now that he really needs to wait for the burn to even have like a chance because he has to have the Alex into immediate burn because he doesn't have enough stalls to just burn things and then stall into an Antonitis. Yeah, yeah. You just really can't do that against Druid. Yeah, especially since Soundstorm just picked up that force of nature, so he's got the inevitability on his side. Starfcrow, ugh, it, it's gonna be really difficult, especially with this Ragnaros. Well, I mean, Loot Hoarder could have 8 health here, so it's not that bad at least. It's like, it, the first, oh never mind, it's not gonna have 8 health. Not going for health, it's not too bad. That's yeah, pretty good Loot Hoarder. Uh, I think as Strifecrow, well he's got Blizzard now, so maybe he could justify like, blizzarding into fireball the rag but like I don't think that's a play to really win the game but he hasn't picked up the burn spells he needs to have after Alex either yet so it's really a gamble with what you think you're gonna next draws are gonna be there's pretty much equal chance for it to be more burn or more board stalls so it's really up to you to just like believe in the heart of cards and figure out is it better for me to go for the Alex plan and just ignore Ragnaros or is it better for me to try and deal with Ragnaros over two turns and Hopefully he gets some sort of Antonitis combo and generate more burns so I can finish the game. Speaking of believing, uh, Strifecrow doesn't know this, but Rosnova Doomsayer would actually be pretty good. Yeah, 50% of the time, right? But he can actually <laughs> just force nature hero power it <laughs> yeah, down. That's, and then... that's the big problem. If he wants to use Fawn as a removal piece here, it would actually be super effective because you're still keeping enough minions on the board that it's going to be impactful. So. I... I... He's doomsaying this after the blizzard. So he's doing both lines at the same time, edging his bets here. Kind of like That's that. That's a really creative line. Yeah. Well, what did that do over Frost Nova? Well, now the rag can be fireballed to be killed next turn, and then he can develop something. So he wants to fight. make sure that if this doomsayer just whiffs, he gets the fireball for sure. Yeah. Exactly. yeah that was so a nice hedge. Even forced the force of nature. Yeah. So he's able to preserve some life. Force off the force of nature and uh, answer the rag now. Yeah, I like that line a lot. Oh, that would have been pretty sweet. Now, he's actually accumulating enough burn that it's going to be somewhat impactful if he does end up finding the many he wants. The thing is, Silent Storm is not remotely out of cards. Like, based on what he's got in his hand, he's not about to stop putting down pressure. Wild Growth is going to cycle. Ancient of Lore is going to cycle. Um, 
And there's no flame strike, right? Like in Strive Course 10, there's no way for him to just clear this board. He's got literally nothing. Oh. He's got to go with the, the fireball that he set up for last turn, I think, and then just play Accolade of Pain and mm -hmm. hopefully try and find some more burn to go with this Alex Traza. Or. Wow, that's ambitious. Hmm. Well, you played double gonna... Acolyte, but it wasn't really. If he wasn't well, setting up to fireball the Ragnaros, then I don't understand why he didn't just uh, Frost Nova so that he could just coin Alex this turn and then just hopefully top deck the burn. I guess now we can see that he wasn't aiming to kill the Ragnaros. He was kind of aiming to just kill the rest of the board and then maybe his guys here tank Ragnaros. And I think Strife Crow. And he also drew the second Ice Lance, so he's now going for some kind of. Perhaps a top like a frost bolt. Yeah, yeah, with double block here, he could definitely set up to be able to deal with it if he doesn't get popped. Uh, so he just wants as much card as he can to get a second fireball, perhaps, or frost bolt, and that would be enough to kill his opponent. Because I mean, the thing is, there is healing right now in Soundstorm's hand, but Strife Crow can't really play around that too much at this point. Um, and he's popped, not at a great number, but that's good enough. Yeah, he was really hoping he couldn't be popped there. He was hoping Silent Storm wouldn't have the roar there, and uh, Silent Storm was able to pop him there. So now Strife Crow is unable to Alex. So even if he does get the fireball that he needs to have the burn to win the game, uh, Alex uh, can't come down this turn. So Healbot, Heal. What about Healbot Nova? Yeah, it seems to be one of the really. Well, the thing ones. is, you can't Ice Block. I mean, you could play Healbot Ice Block, and you freeze one of the minions, and you hope he doesn't have. The swipe, but that's not very yeah. likely. You have to get the uh, you have to get the ice block up or kill the rag. Goodbye, rag. Well, this is going to be a good fireball. The thing is, now Soundstorm is about to draw the rest of his deck, so there's a possibility that he oh, oh never double mind. swipe top deck. <laughs> that oh, is insane. Man. Oh well. I mean, even Good if he hadn't gotten the double swipe and the doomsayer goes off, like Strife Crow's used so much of his burn. How does he win at that point? Yeah, that's a top deck, and so Alex Storm can just keep drawing for a while. Like he's not about to die anyway, right? Like Alex Straza might be used defensively. Sure, um, sure. So I don't know. It would have been very difficult for Strike to, to outlive his opponent. Well, I guess that's what you get. Some of those matches. So Druid's a good matchup for uh, for Sound yeah, Storm. Both the, the teams have gotten uh, some of the harder decks to get out out immediately by just sort of aggressively queuing them first, and that's. Sort of something uh, that a lot of the teams have been doing, it's been a trend that I've been observing a lot, is that people take the weaker classes and queue up with them first. And uh, they've been getting rewarded for it, so... I guess there's sort of like a queuing meta. Yeah. <laughs> like the meta well, of how people queue decks. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to say, like, Druid is a class that, you know, when Archon Team League started, it was a class that everybody regarded as that sixth class that you bring, right? You kind of leave it, uh, it's among the last classes you want to take. Like, it's like, there's four of them you really don't want to bring. And Druid was among them, but it seems like Rogue is getting interchanged a bit um, at this point in many, many teams' lineups. And we see Druid come up a little bit more often. Like, is there any reason for that specifically? Like, I know it does have decent matches. Matchups, but I can't uh, quite pinpoint it. Originally, not everyone was sold on the Freeze Mage idea. So in the earlier weeks, not every single team was bringing Freeze Ma Mage. But after everyone was seeing all the success Freeze Mage was having from like a bunch of players playing Freeze Mage and just being able to consistently get a matchup against one of the weaker decks like Paladin or like Priest or like Rogue or like Hunter or like Zoo, which is like a lot of decks that are yeah. pretty common. Uh, Everyone started bringing Freeze Mage. Now there's every single team pretty much has a Freeze Mage every week. So that really increases the power of Druid. Whereas before, the Mage decks were oftentimes like Tempo Mage or some sort of Mech Mage. And that's going to that's gonna hard counter Druid. So the Mage matchup for Druid went from a hard counter into something that now Druid easily beats. Yeah, speaking of easily beats, Silent Storm must be feeling really good on that one after having no play until turn 4 where he wild gross. That was probably one of the only matchups that you could get away with that hand. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. That's a great yeah. point, because this is a disaster hand like 99% of the time. And in this case, it wasn't that bad. In fact, it might have also, I, I think the, the fact that four secrets were in Strive Crow's turn, I mean, that yeah. is just horrible. And the rag was really clutch. Without rag, this couldn't have been done, basically. Yeah, rag was really key there. Strife Crow's hand being really terrible was also pretty important. He didn't even have that much cycle. He didn't have like anything going on. He didn't hit his accolade of pains until he was like already dead. So, uh, Strife Crow was really put in a hard spot. I thought he played uh, 
fairly well though. Being able to like ignore the rag and try and set up for a win condition was pretty smart. Yeah, I think it's one of those things with like Freeze Mage is one of those decks where you often have to just ignore immediate threats and think about your own win condition. You know, six turns, like sometimes three, four turns on the line, um, and as a result, you end up taking plays that immediately do nothing. But you know that you're going to be able to survive maybe on one or two health, just a little Arr, bit longer. It's time to walk the plank, Silent Storm. <laughs> Don't do that. No, oh. let's not pistolento, please. No. Is there going to be go pirates there. in his rogue deck? You think? Meaning. Let it be true. Pirates Aha. have really good synergy with weapons. You heard it here first. Whoever just muted there was correct to do so. What was that? If it wasn't you, Five, I guess it was Noxious. Okay, well, we've uh, muted Noxious for the time being, so you can sort out his wind tunnel. Uh, it's coming through by quite a bit, but it's okay. Hopefully, your ears are not destroyed. Yeah, mine are kind of semi intact. Uh, Alright, we're getting into the game here. So, as right. a Priest player queuing into this matchup, how do you think Silent Storm feels? Okay, I'm back. Is, is everything okay? What just happened to my microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm back in. Sorry guys for this uh, microphone difficulty. Alright, I was asking a question actually before my wind tunnel started kicking in. Um, right. Has Kalento been playing as much All Rogue? Since the advent of the deck, as he has been like as he played Miracle Rogue back in the days, because I know it was one of his favorite classes. Um, but he's been playing a lot of stuff since GVG. Yeah, yeah one I thing I note about Kalento, and it's kind of cool uh, when I watch his stream. He plays a lot of oddball decks, and from what I can tell, it's it might be because he feels confident enough in his ability to play all the decks at this point, and he's just like, okay, maybe there's something that I missed, so I'm just gonna do some mad science. So, I like that about Kalento. Yeah, definitely a very well-rounded player. Can play just about anything. So, with the Harrison Jones there, Silent Storm might have a chance here. Especially since Kalento's hand is pretty weak. Yeah, he needs to pick up a sprint in order to improve it. Like, if he gets a prep sprint off, I think that things might change. But for the time being, um, it's not that amazing. And the Harrison Jones can also equalize. Huh, it's kind of awkward for Kalento. Yeah. But... He's been put in positions like this before. Like, you see him go all-in very quickly. The thing is, going all-in against your priest doesn't tend to work very well. Because it can mitigate the burst that you're attempting to pull off. So it's not one of the best classes to just shove everything in against. Oh, he's yeah, going to be so forced to make a tough call on whether or not to use these two pieces of removal on these two minions. Wow, that is aggressive. Really aggressive. Looking. He's got a zombie chow on board. I'm not sure if I like that. Like, he's going to be able to heal in the future anyway. But uh, he's going to take the aggressive clear there, just relieve pressure immediately. I can understand it, because if uh, I'm Kalento and I look at my hand, I'm like, oh man, I don't think I can deal with this zombie chow for the next three turns. True, true. Yeah, and then Velen's Chosen hits, and then you want to die. Oh, exactly. Velen's Chosen could definitely be really punishing there. Yeah. Even Powered Shield's a problem. I mean, a little less, of course, but... Ezra Drake's really good, issue. too. Mm-hmm. Anything to be able to cycle. Oh, this Harrison Jones is going to be able to come down on this Tinker Sharp Sword Oil. And this is what I'm saying when I say, you know, Kalento takes those all in lines when he plays uh, All Rogue. I see him do this kind of stuff all the time. And uh, every single time I just. Uh, those are play. I would be much more conservative to the point where maybe I would lose these games, like single handedly, just because I didn't, you know, use up the Eviscerate, use up the South Sea Deckhand. Yeah. He used the Saucy Deckhand and the Eviscerate on the previous turn to set up to oil mm -hmm. down the next minion that was played. This is definitely an interesting line. And uh, it worked out for him to keep tempo. If there wasn't a Harrison Jones there, that line would have worked out really sick. So it was definitely very solid. 
I don't want to just characterize off Cloud9 in a bunch, but uh, from my talks with Strafko, at least, he's one of the players who really, really cares about Tempo and Kalento, too, from like my brief talk. So to some extent, I guess if you ask Kalento, oh, do you think that my play was reasonable? He would just answer, uh, easy game. Uh, turn three, play all the mana. Turn four, play all the mana. It's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he's like, you know, excess cards, uh, you know, that's acceptable, but excess mana, that isn't. I can see that. I mean, Rogue, it is, is, after all, you know, an aggro control deck in the way that it functions, and if you never get that tempo through the control tools that you've got, you're never going to get anywhere. I could see that. Yeah, it's definitely kind of true, but Priest is one of those matchups, though, where, like, oh it's my not always... Gosh. Oh, <laughs> there's. I mean, no that's the tempo play. That's the tempo play there. So that makes sense. It follows through with all the logic of the other plays he's been making. But this isn't always a matchup that's 100% about tempo because sometimes priests can get into situations where they can actually outheal your burst, especially with the South Sea uh, deckhand gone. And now your oils aren't guaranteed to hit anymore. And one oil's already gone, and the priest's still at 30. So, yeah, this. Normally it looks really bad for the priest, but here it's going way above uh, what could even be imaginable. You not only get one Harrison, but two Harrisons. I'd run two Harrisons in priest if I knew I was going to go up against Rogue. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What I think is really great. interesting is the fact that you like Silent Storm queued up into this matchup, and when he saw Rogue, he must have felt devastated. He's like, oh god, that's the one thing I didn't want to go up against. And it's not going too badly right now. Yeah. The power shield was a pretty good draw. It allows him to bump into the uh, SI7 agent and Holy Nova, which sets up for the light bomb next turn. Or do you play yeah, I'll be good. that? Uh, I don't nothing know. you can run it into yeah. to cause both things to die. Well, think. you could I, smash the Violet Teacher into the Drake. I kind of like that. Oh, no? yeah, good call. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's a... Like, you're leaving the 3-3 three, three up, but it's not that big a threat. Yeah, yeah. It's, I like this line too. It seems good. The 3 3 doesn't even contest the Northshire directly, and it can't generate a ton of 1 1s to lock you into having to play the Light Bomb next turn. And 2 Shadow Madness is actually extremely effective against Priest. Priest has pretty limited number of minions in the deck, and uh, uh, one of the ways Priest can beat Rogue is by just killing every single one of Rogue's minions and not allowing for oils to hit for the entire game. So do you play two minions here and run into Light Bomb, or do you just play one minion and dagger up to finish off with the SI? Well, I guess he's going to go for the two of them, or maybe just weapon up behind Earthen Ring. Oh well, yeah, you can't play the SI, he's yeah. only got two mana left. <laughs> but uh, I still think from uh, Silent Storm's, Silent Storm's in a really solid spot. He's got the Shadow Madness here to clean off both the minions, and he can develop the Death Lord if he wants to. Yeah, and this is a tough position for Kalento. He hesitated for a moment whether or not to attack. Normally you wouldn't, but Kalento has the knowledge that Sunstorm 100% has Harrison Jones. Yeah. Double Shadow Madness is just kind of nailing the coffin here. Yeah, both those Shadow Madnesses gave some good two-for-ones for Sunstorm. Yeah. And when you consider the fact that there is a Harrison Jones on the back end, you have to wait for Blade Flurry at any point to do anything with your weapons. Otherwise, they're going to just sit there and feed the priest even more value. And down goes Ysera. Uh, it's interesting that he plays Ysera. They're there over like, maybe like Shadow or Death or something. I expected the Death or... yeah. It's I totally greedier. expected Ysera. You got 9 mana. You got to play her sometime. I guess that's true. It is going to be sad. I just would be afraid of, like, the board I mean, getting even more. I guess you have Light Bomb if the board gets too out of yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, like, ultimately, Isara here is not a bad play just because you're so high on health that there's no way the rogue's going to burst you down. And y if they do end up dealing with Isara in any way, uh, you know, through a sap, at least we got a small card you can replay afterwards. Perhaps one like Isara Awakens or. Um, yeah. The Drake. In this case, it's not that bad either, because Laughing Sister can be removed through spells. It's like nothing's really that bad with this hero. I mean, it's really good when the rogue opponent does not have sap. You gotta be feeling pretty good about that. It looks like Silent Storm is gonna be taking this game here, because this light bomb clearing the board completely. Kalento still hasn't found a sprint yet. Wow. Just 
heal up the Asera and draw some cards. So you're looking for Crazed Alchemist here, right? Divine Spirit, Crazed Alk? Yeah, if he runs it, that would be pretty insane. Kalenta you know, one really... day I'm sure we'll have one deck like this. It'll happen. <laughs> I mean, Crazed Alchemist used to be standard back in the day of Pagel. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, those days. I don't miss them. Not one bit. I mean, Kalenta actually has been using some kind of Inner Fire Divine Spirit deck, too, on the ladder, right. so... Yeah. Crazed Alchemist isn't that far off. Yeah, and Crusher and uh, Black Wolf actually came up with a semi-decent combo priest list. They used something along those lines. They were more like combo-oriented, and it didn't do too bad. I think they both hit Legend in the first week of the season with it. That was kind of funny. Oh, well. But I'm sure we'll see one day that archetype just become ridiculous. There will come a day. This is almost like going through the motions, right? Like, th this yeah. this rogue pretty much can't kill the priest. There's absolutely... Well, he needed to find exactly Sprint there to really have too much of a chance. But he's gonna keep trying for it. Um, I don't know if redaggering there is even good. Like, Harrison Jones is coming down now. And the priest is gonna be able to draw into more heal, more stuff. Because two cards is good. But I guess you gotta figure, you gotta get the Harrison Jones out of the way sometime. Might as well bait him with the incentive of two cards so you don't have to lose any weapon buffs. Yeah, that's probably the rationale. The thing is, it's like you're optimizing the play, but you know it's ultimately not gonna do much. Yeah. What could come out of this Death Lord that changes anything at all? Yeah, Storm feeling rightfully confident enough to heal himself over your Sarah there. Yeah, he doesn't want to draw yeah. too many cards, maybe. Oh, also, he is at too many cards, that's right. Yeah, he doesn't want to draw too many cards. He wants to just make sure Crystal, he can uh, have health. He's already got card advantage. He's going to win off card advantage as long as he doesn't die to some crazy burst. What if we see a um, Malagos off the Death Lord? Oh, man. Do you know how beautiful <laughs> that would be? Do you know how beautiful that would that be? Would, that would be a sick comeback. <laughs> yeah. But th then the priest just plays Sylvanas and Shadow Word deaths her, and then he gets Malagos and then Holy Novas for seven. <laughs> and that's still the game. <laughs> uh, oh, obviously no Malagos, it seems. We can dream, can we? Oh! Shadow's not bad. Yeah, you can get Lord Walker Show and give that priest some deadly poisons. <laughs> Clog up his hand and start milling him. Oh man, this is a nightmare. Huh. I'm not the one walking the plank today, says Sandstorm. Yeah, Priest has had pretty solid results in the team league overall. What's the what's the win rate so far for them? I haven't oh, looked yeah. at I know every time they were brought, like they weren't brought that frequently though, but every time they were brought they did somewhat okay. Yeah. Um the first player to bring it Which week I think it was like in week two, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was, was uh, Gara, but he he lost his game with it. Yeah, Gara brought it before. I've seen Dog from Value Town bring it a few times. Mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> so there was that one week where Priest did really good in, um, what tournament was that? There was some like tournament that Priest did really really well in. They Crypt casted. Oh, Nog, uh, One Nation of Gamers, perhaps. Might, Might have been, been one of those one, tournaments, no. but Priest yeah. like. Made it. Gara was playing, and Dog was playing, and another guy was playing. All were playing Priest, and all did extremely well in that tournament. So then Priest started appearing everywhere, and then it started fizzling out a little bit. And now we're seeing Silent Storms trying to bring it back. Well, yeah, there's been a few appearances of the, of the class. It's not so much that the class is, you know, terrible and unplayable. It's just that it's got this little niche that you've got to find for it. Um, and I, I think also there's the fact that. Once Priest is out of the metagame for a long enough amount of time, the decks that become standard don't have as many you know decks play matches played against it. So gauging how to play the matchup becomes a little more difficult for the players who might not have done it before. Uh. All right. Well, Silent Storm's out. He's done. He can actually go home and uh, get some, I guess, well-deserved rest at this point. Just uh, pretty good performance from him. And Frozen Ice and Tiddler are going to have to carry through. Now, if Celestial gets the win, this is going to be their first win in the entire league. And that would be a good one. Yeah. Well, we have... Yeah, uh, the teams are pretty much rooting for Celestial because that'll push them further ahead. 
Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> and Celestials wins don't matter as much unless you're fighting with them in last place. So I guess the one team currently rooting against Celestial would be Force and Boys. Uh, because basically anyone who only has two wins right now is a little bit afraid that Celestial will win the next three weeks. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely possible. Which is exactly what Celestial needs to do. Uh, so they've got a rough road ahead of them, but it's still possible. This win is absolutely necessary for them. Yeah, they're definitely yeah. in a favored position here. Getting Priest and Druid out of the way, they're left with what I would consider the four top Core? classes currently. Yeah, right. So yeah, I feel it's... like they're at a huge advantage here. I mean, the thing is, they're still up against the four top classes as well, right? So they're still going to... You could say they're going to flip coins, but not really. Um, it's more of a matter of them playing out the matches and hoping to queue into the good ones. Because sometimes you'll be able to lock a game against a class that you might not want to face off. Say, as a Warlock player, you don't want to run into you know, mid-range Hunter, let's say. Uh, if you can get that Warlock win out of the way against a favorable matchup, then that's less risk of you getting that bad matchup. Yeah, the tough part from Cloud9 here is uh, the Rogue has no like really solid matchups. Like, Assuming that Frozen Ice is a face hunter, which he's been known to bring face hunter a lot, then mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be favored slightly against the Rogue, probably 55 to 65% in favor of the face hunter. And then if he has Zoo, I'd say that's pretty much a dead even 50-50 against Rogue. And then Freeze Mage is obviously favored against Rogue. And then uh, Patron closer to 50-50, but still maybe a little bit patron-favored. And then Control Warrior would be really favored against Rogue, but we've already seen the Warrior, right? It was patron. Uh, so, from Tiddler, yeah, it was a patron yeah, yeah. Warrior. Uh, but the Mage, we have to assume again, Freeze Mage. So Rogue versus Freeze Mage can run into problems because it runs out of burst. That's always the issue, is you can kill them with one massive hit, but getting that, you know, that extra 16 damage you need to do against uh, Ice Barrier Board, your 3-3s don't live, Violet Teacher needs to get Fireballed. If she doesn't, I guess sometimes you can get some decent value, but, you know, sapping minions isn't the best way to deal with them necessarily. Yeah, so if Frozen Ice has face hunter, then I think in this position, Rogue's like best odds of winning a series is uh, like 50 to 55%, which is not the greatest situation to be in for Cloud9 here, because the best matchups for Rogue, Priest and Druid, are both already gone. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, if you have any thoughts about the matchups, don't hesitate to tweet hashtag ATLC. Any thoughts on what's going to happen today? Maybe support some of the players. Any comments as well? Those are also appreciated. It'll show up on screen probably at some point. Um, now, I just want to know, like, is Cloud9 never going to queue up the rogue right now? Or is they, are they just going to have to wait? Because the bench rule, I guess, would apply, and you'd be a little scared of doing that. Yeah, so there's definitely really always uh, some sort of mind games with the bench rule, because a lot of people are like... All right, I don't want to get benched. Let's not queue up into the bench rule. But then the other team assumes that they're not going to queue up into the bench rule. So they're like, all right, they're not going to play these classes. So let's play what's best against not those classes. And then sometimes you're just like, well, they're going to know that we're going to know that they don't want to get benched. So then maybe we should just play into the bench rule so that when they try and think we're not going to play into the bench rule, we can catch them off guard and get our rogue out of the way when it's like our trickiest matchup to get out. So there's definitely some mind games there. Trump, what do you think about that? <laughs> you seem perplexed. <laughs> well, Cloud9 is actually just famous for flipping coins, so... Okay. I, think, I mean, when they decide what matchup to bring. So there's all this mind games where you can just be like, ah, th th these mind games are dumb. Let, let me do a Clinton impression. It just doesn't matter. Just flip the coin, choose the deck, no mind games. Well, see, the problem with flipping coins, though, is if your opponents know that you're flipping coins, then they know, like, what percentages they have of having a favorable matchup. So you're going to have to flip weighted coins if you want it to truly be random. So you'd have to weight <laughs> coins depending on how <laughs> many classes you have. We that argument because it actually doesn't matter. You, I'm going to order I some uh, nine-sided die. That's all I'm going to do. I mean, if you roll a nine-sided die, though, and you have three classes that are bad against one specific class, then, like, it's... It's different. You're, yeah, you're getting Depends like three bad matches. Bring, and I was bought into this Cloud9 school of thought because uh, you eventually need to bring up your bad class, so it doesn't matter. Like, you, There's schools of thoughts where you bring the worst class because you might win one, or you bring your best class because you uh, have the most, your highest chance against everything. But as it turns out, if you just randomize, it's pretty much all good. Yeah, what if you beat the, like, let's say you have a, a rogue, right? And there's a face hunter, and you want to get that face hunter out of the way with something else before you queue up the rogue. 
wouldn't that be a good reason to maybe try to play around the mind games? That, that's kind of what I, the way I think about it. Like, you want to lock the win against that face hunter. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's where you start or to let it win, rather, a little bit uh, apart on the randomized school of thought because uh, there is that extra rule of the bench where you have to consider the slight pros and cons of it. Um, yeah. uh, right now, it looks like there's some trouble getting onto Battle.net, so the players are just getting connected still. That's fine. We can look at their image. Ecop is looking very sane on this image. That's what I like about it. Perfectly yeah, sane. Eyes are a lot smaller than normal here. Yeah, by a long shot. I wonder if that was intentional to make him less intimidating. <laughs> yeah, I guess if they make him too intimidating, it's just not fair, right? Yeah, Frozen Ice's <laughs> avatar might just leave. Yeah, <laughs> just run Although away. He, yeah, he he. The thing is, he's the aggressor, right? Like in every single match. And what do you think about that playstyle, by the way? Like he's a player that's almost too predictable with the types of decks that he brings at this point. Um, he always seems to bring Face Hunter. At least he's brought it quite a bit. And Zoo. Like those are the two decks that I. If you ask me, what does Frozen Eyes play? Those are the two decks I tell you. Is is that bad? And even in the team league format, where maybe that's compensated by the fact that your teammates can maybe uh, get some of the bad matchups out of the way. I think uh, generating a pattern and then breaking it is extremely strong. Like, if you say play Face Hunter three weeks in a row, and then your fourth week, everyone's gonna assume you're playing Face Hunter, and then you just throw out like some sort of crazy weird hunter and just confuse them. It's very strong. Or if they all, if you always play Zoo every single week, three four weeks in a row, and then switch to Handlock all of a sudden, no one is gonna think you're playing Handlock. Hey, <laughs> that's what you did yesterday, mate. <laughs> I remember that. I was like, oh, yeah. Firebat's gonna play Zoo, and then Handlock showed up. It's kind of like bringing Snipe in a hunter deck, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, just do If you do something three to four times, everyone's gonna assume you're gonna do it the fifth time. Every, every single person will assume you're doing the same exact thing. So you get that. If you're switching every single time, then they're always gonna do safe mulligans. They're gonna mulligan, like, Kind of for maybe maybe they'll mulligan for zoo, but they're gonna keep like handlock in mind and have some like keep one card maybe that's good against handlock or whatever, and be a little more safe with their choices. But if they know a hundred percent confident that you're one archetype or the other, and then they mulligan for just that one, you can oftentimes burn them and get a free win. Okay, so we have to optimize the the, the shuffling pattern. So do you do let's say four zoos, one handlock, or do you go four zoos, four handlocks, four zoos, four handlocks? Like, what's the... How do you generate that pattern? Like, at what point oh. do you just decide to break it, right? That's the... That's I mean, a big question. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea what is optimal. We'd have to do, like, some sort of survey. Yeah, we'd have like, to. Like, a sample size and then figure out what's optimal. Because this could actually right. be extremely relevant for all these leagues that keep popping up. Because there's been, like, so many Hearthstone leagues. And then if you can figure out the optimal pattern to confuse your opponent the maximum percent of the times, then that could be worth money. Yeah, <laughs> you can sell that secret, you know, to yeah. Markov. I, I've got I mean, the, the optimal math. I've got the math done on this. Yeah, I mean, well, you could just, like, make it happen during the series and then get wins by confusing your opponent. Yeah. And then take all the prize money. Yeah, it actually you, turns out, like, this might seem a hard, but statistics are so important in Hearthstone, especially in tournaments. <laughs> just having the spreadsheets, crunching the numbers, that's pretty important. Firebat is well known for having... His patented spreadsheet, I guess. Yeah, they're yeah. definitely really key. Just all as much information as you can, just to get those little edges. Because so what, one, uh, I'm gonna you know go on a sidetrack here. Um, there's a new card that's been announced called the Grand Crusader, six mana five five, battle cry. Add a random paladin card to your hand. It's a neutral card, six mana five five oh. that puts a random paladin card in anyone's hand. So you're gonna get it. Like that sounds... you can be a rogue with it. Sounds really solid in Priest with Cabal Shadow Priest, because a lot of the Paladin cards, it, even some of the new ones, are oriented around making minions attacks one, and then you can combine that with Cabal Shadow Priest to take things like, I don't know, Deathwing, Tyrion, like whatever you want. <laughs> Deathwing, <laughs> and here it comes, the Deathwing meta, as yeah, predicted by Firebat. That'd be cool. <laughs> but I mean, like, just being able to take any creature sounds pretty good. Turns out it's pretty good. Yeah. That was uh, good that you immediately thought of Priest. I, I agree. Like One of the things that I would have most liked if you were to be able to mix two class cards together would be Priest and Paladin. Um, so how good is a 6-mana 5-5 five, five draw card? Mm, uh, it's... I don't know. I mean, 
six mana five five draw two innervates is really good. Uh, six mana five five draw one card. Uh, the thing is, it's a random uh, card that doesn't necessarily advance your deck's purpose. Oh, by the way, little interruption there. We're being told that Ecov couldn't actually get to connect, and since the classes were already revealed, where you know the the fault is basically. Uh, given to Cloud9. So what's going to happen is for the next match that we're going to have, uh, Cloud9, instead of getting a loss, will have to dictate, or tell rather, which deck they're going to be playing, and then, or which class rather, and Team Celestial will be able to counterpick that. So we're making a little uh, exception here since there was no no game started and no game cancelled. So we'll see how that ends up uh, panning out. But we'll be having a new matchup. I like that, sucks. It's fair. Yeah, I guess. I they get hard countered though, and then lose. What's the difference between that? I mean, I guess instead of There's getting a hundred percent, hundred percent loss, it's now instead like sixty-five percent to lose. I think that's well, fair. You can't just bring a deck which uh, isn't completely. I mean, you can bring a deck. There are decks out there which are like fifty, like a range of forty-five to fifty-five against right. most everything. For example, Rogue. They could take Rogue. Like this is this might be a good opportunity for Cloud9 to throw Rogue in, unless Frozen Ice is playing Face Hunter. I don't no, know. What do you? Rogue would be no, no. Yeah, you can't. Terrible. You, you throw in. Pa you throw in like Patron. Like. <laughs> I mean, Patron. <laughs> what, what do they? Play. Wait, okay, what do they yeah. throw in against Patron? They're like uh, Patron Mirror. Like. <laughs> well, if you're Frozen right. You're right. Would bring a Hamlock, then that would be a bad choice. But Frozen Ice, I think, has played Zoo for the last four weeks, so he can't bring a Hamlock, right? Absolutely uh, not. I don't know. <laughs> But even Handlock's not that bad for Patron. There's a few players that believe it's favored for Patron. Uh, Zixo is the most known for saying that. But there's, I think it's a lot closer to 50-50 than people think. I definitely still think it's Handlock favored. But if uh, Patron gets Emperor on turn 6, I definitely think it's actually uh, Patron favored. Patron favored, yeah, I could see that. Now, Kalento's going to be queuing up a Warrior, so I guess you're right. I mean, ultimately, it's the, the one class and the one archetype where... Even though there may be somewhat bad matchups, there is still very winnable. So, yeah, I think if you're Cloud9, you calculate uh, which of your decks has the most even matchups against everything, and you decide mm -hmm. that Patron is the one. And I agree yeah. with that. Uh, interesting that Celestial brings Warlock. We'll see if it's Handlock. I it might actually be soon, am one of the still. people who uh, believes it's far above fifty percent. Actually, I'm more of the sixty-five to seventy percent camp in Handlock. That's how much I like that deck. I think one of the big things that a lot of the patron players don't do that really helps the matchup a lot is uh, they hold on to things too often. Uh, if you can just put some chip damage on some of the taunts, you can break through them with like an unstable ghoul inner rage and then execute like the other taunt. So I think uh, just throwing down a frothing on turn three is okay, and just throwing down warsong commanders occasionally, especially if you have the other frothing or you have the other warsong, just getting little bits of chip damage in on the face or on future taunts is really important. And so it turns out Frozen Ice is playing a mid-range demon lock, I'm guessing. Mid-range yeah. demon zoo, I don't know how you want to call that deck anymore, there's like seven variations of it. Yeah, he's doing a good job of disguising himself as handlock right now. <laughs> yeah, Talento even kept the execute, he 100% thinks that Frozen Ice is handlock right now. So, he's gonna be in for a shock, we gotta watch his face when like this Nerubian egg comes into play. See if he's confused. It's gonna be pretty decent as well. Just because your follow-up turn is actually enabling the egg to attack and then you can eat it up. So... I guess there's drawbacks to that play just because executes there at the moment. But it's really not... Like, at least you're forcing it out eventually. It's not gonna hit your Doom Guard, for instance. You know, Kalenta actually reacted to that. I was just looking at his face because it was uh, gonna be so interesting. And he yeah. was... Uh, he just, like, shifted off to the side and was like... He voiced over, <laughs> his hand sucks. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is glorious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the side shift. All right. I mean, it's still possible for uh, Demon Zoo to recover from positions like this. If he's able to, like, top deck a Melganis and then void caller slash void terror out the Melganis and put on extreme pressure and maybe, like, have two giant threats so one executes not enough. Yeah, the thing is, yeah, in this actually. position, uh, Frozen Ice, I mean, Kalento is probably not too worried about Malganis, just because Fire War Axe and uh, Minion would kill the, the Void Caller, and then you can kill the other one, the, the Malganis would execute. So, I don't know if he's really that worried about it. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that Firebat because last week uh, I actually cast the Archon match and I believe you were the zoo against the patron. That was one of the most fantastic zoo yes. versus patron matches I've ever seen. Yeah, I feel like the matchup's not as bad as people say, but uh, it's still not the greatest. You don't feel too great as the zoo player, but it's definitely winnable. And uh, maybe if I made the right trade at the end, I could have won that. <laughs> The problem is, though, if you don't kill them in time, they can definitely get into the positions where they can come back from just, like, one life and then fill in a yeah, you lose patrons and you lose, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Colento is clearly set up to execute there, and this time around he sees a Void Terror, so that changes his complete plan. Uh, I like how he quickly adapted to that, uses the slam instead. It's a good call. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of an awkward turn. Do you are you forced to play a beast of sergeant with defensive Argus just to deal with oh. that armor smith? That's the milk so is... so close to being good. Yeah, so if, close. If Kalento hadn't uh, had the foresight there to deal with the void caller that turn, then uh, Frozen Ice would have been able to punish him a little bit. But Kalento made the correct play and was able to identify the threat and deal with it immediately. I don't know. I think Kalento made the play assuming that. Malgamus was going to come out. Like, he made mm -hmm. his entire play, assuming, okay, it's 9 7, I'm just going to run my one guy into it and execute. So, I don't think it mattered that much. Well, I mean, like, if. Uh, I mean, I'm saying, like, if he didn't make that play and didn't deal with it, assuming the Malgamus would come out. Because a lot of players in that situation typically like to wait for the Warlock player to pop out the Void Terror. But uh, he would have gotten punished in that sense because then there would be the giant Void Terror and the Malgamus. Like, mm. if he had just not dealt with it. As it turns out, he's still going to be in an okay position. Yeah, a tricky spot for Frozen Ice because he couldn't mm -hmm. kill the armor smith and kill the egg. Uh -huh. It was either or. But then again, if you give your opponent the ability to, like, to get initiative on the egg, how big of a deal is that? Because you know he can't charge patrons. How much of a problem would that have been? Well, he can't charge patrons yet. He's nowhere near yeah, the manifest. Exactly. So, yeah. from Frozen Ice's perspective, like, was it that big of a deal if you didn't enable the egg right now? Well, well from the wanted... Warlock perspective, you have to kill your opponent as quickly as possible. Frozen Ice isn't actually pulling that off at all, so he's feeling really bad about this game right now. I have to imagine. Yeah, you have to like turn nine or ten, and you you have to be basically killing them because even if they have like one or two health at turn nine or ten, they can clear your entire board, and then the only direct damage you have out of hand is uh, like Doom Guard, and if you don't have the Doom Guard there, then they can just have an entire board of patrons which sets up lethal on you. Right. Oh man, this is so bad. Frozen Ice's options are all horrible. Like, he, nothing he does is going to give that Gnomish Inventor worse than like a two for one in terms of actions per I don't like Lothab here. I think uh, you need to save Lothab for later. That can buy you an extra turn later game where they can't actually get off with patrons on you. So yeah. I would have liked to see maybe like Knife Juggler, Argus, and try and just uh, push them. Yeah. yeah, if they don't have a weapon, then there's a chance that the defend the uh, Knife Juggler lives. They have to get a weapon or a buff or a whirlwind effect. I, I, I do understand the merit of Lothab just because it's so much immediate pressure. Mm -hmm. So, as Kalento here, what, what do you do? Well, uh, getting the Acolyte behind a ghoul seems very reasonable to me. Get rid of the... I guess the interesting thing is also which one do you kill between the 3-2 and the 2-1 if you plan on playing a ghoul. I think you kill the 2-1. If you're going to play the ghoul, I think killing the 2-1 makes just a tiny bit more sense. Just because the the, the Flame Imp still dies. Uh, I mean, you just attack with the Lothab then, and then the Flame Imp wouldn't die. So I like killing yeah, the off the 3-2 instead, so the 2-1 just guaranteed to die unless he gets Argus. Or power overwhelmed. Yeah, you have to buff it in order to, to keep it alive. Yeah, okay, I see mm -hmm. that. And Patron is just sitting very comfortably here on 28 health on turn 7. There's zero pressure coming from the Warlock player. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't see how Frozen Ice is supposed to push in that much damage past this point. Like, Shield Block, Armor Smith. It's gonna be really so. difficult. If, uh, 
If Kalento never pick up, there's the War Song Commander. Never mind, he's got no hope. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, like, if he doesn't pick up the War Song Commander, he can make it happen still, but with yeah. the War Song Commander there, it's gonna be a lot harder. Maybe the uh, last execute could be used on this Lothab and you could try and get Melganus down. And if that guy sticks around, then I guess. I mean, at this point, it's funny enough, but Kalento wouldn't really have a good answer to Malganus if well, that were to come out. He can probably just patron it to death on turn 9. So. The way you say it just sounds so balanced. <laughs> it just yeah. sounds so balanced. It's 1 3 3 to kill that 9 7. Yeah, when I'm patron, I make it to the end game against Zoo, and I have a lot of health. I like to role play as Nefarian, just be like, haha, infinite <laughs> mana, <laughs> armor track scales, so uh, many 3-3s three just for free. Uh, just because you can. And then the thing is, your opponent can't even get out of it. You know, if you're doing it, everything fast enough and queuing up, he can't actually concede. There is no way. He has to go through the animation process. And that is rage-inducing. Yeah. The animations. I mean, sometimes uh, the animations can work good for patron because they can annoy your opponent. So that's always fun. But a lot of times, the animations can really punish the patron warrior player by just taking too long. I actually did a test just for fun to see how long animations could take for you to be unable to kill your opponent. If you have two frothings on the field and they, your opponent has three belchers, and you do two whirlwind effects you can't actually get through all three belchers. Like, they just take too long to die, slash add up the damage from the frothings. So, so you you're saying we should all play Echo Mage, right? Just Echo duplicate. Mage is extremely strong against Patron, yeah. yeah. But yeah, if they if they have three belchers, you just literally cannot queue up the actions to kill them. Well, that should be... Oh. He's putting in... The last ditch effort for pressure, but uh, yeah, I was surprised by that. But I guess at this point, it doesn't really matter what Frozen Ice does. I mean, it always matters. He can find a way to win, I'm sure. If uh, better believe it. If Glento doesn't pick up a whirlwind effect, he can't actually make that many patrons. That's true. Currently, he can make zero, but like well, you make you can make one. Yeah, well, <laughs> but yeah. playing it out of hand, but. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much zero. Well, I think you tap. Do you really have a choice? It doesn't matter at this point. Like, you have to try to go for it. Oh. Oh, that kills well, you. Well, that, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> that, that's a problem. Leaving that up kills you, too. Um, what? Uh, I mean, I what? guess you could... You got a power of warming trade to stay alive. The implosion... This is so bad, but yeah, I guess you have to try it. No, you have to implosion. You have to live the dream as yeah. you implosion, and then you play Malganus. You hope you get the four. You hope they don't have patrons. That's, oh, you I die. Think that's my you point. die every time. <laughs> I'm optimistic. Trump, yeah. Trump believes. You have to go, from, like, your, your chances are so poor. Like, you have to almost... I feel like with this hand, if you're Zoo, you have to use the implosion to have a chance, because uh, in order to win, you have to be so optimistic that your opponent has nothing. Like, you're not going to win by just hitting him for three each turn. You may be right. You may be right. Pass me that arc light spinner. Yeah, I think Kalento's doing the same you are. He's like, just taking his sweet time. There's no threat at all. Yeah. He was too off lethal last turn. With the Frothing Warsong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well... The dream will not be lived by Frozen Ice, not here. Yeah, it's looking like a pretty sad ending to this really poor zoo draw. And that's one of the the things that a uh, demon zoo can often do. They have so many demons and threats and mid-range things now that they can get that kind of clunky draw. But then oftentimes they can get those crazy draws where you just have Melganus on turn four. But, uh, <laughs> to yeah. pop up your implosion. And it yeah. still do and it still doesn't win the game because somehow. Yeah. Well, uh, it's all over. And this is a case of very long animations, probably. Yeah. I mean, it's not gonna be like two minutes long, but. Yeah. 
this is still quite a few animations. You got the frothing to trigger, you got the armor smith. The worst, I think, is when you've actually got like two frothings, two armor smiths. This is yeah, just it's... excruciating. Yeah. You go through that, and there's literally no way for you to get out of it before like two minutes and a half pass. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the animation that's the worst though is the Belcher because you can't queue up the additional attacks until the taunt actually spawns. So. That's like an animation time that is like all in the other Fixed, animation yeah. times. Like you can queue up after it's while it's going. So like while the armor smith's giving you armor, you can queue up the next actions. So you can actually at the end of your two minutes of waiting, your attack actually happens. Yeah. But the only one that's really screwed up is with Belcher because uh, you have to wait for all the animations to happen, and that doesn't correspond with your turn time. Yeah, well, I, I think patron as well, you know, when they spawn, um, sometimes yeah, when you have yeah. stuff happening in between, you'll have the exact same issue, which is the reason, you know, a lot of lethals have been missed in tournament settings, where exactly. people are thinking through their turn, and it's just, I don't know, they just lose on the back of it. Um, and funny enough, everybody thought the timer was 90 seconds, but apparently they changed it sometime in closed beta to where it's 75, and I hadn't realized that. Huh. I hadn't realized they made that change, it was a stealth change to the timer, and I don't know. Maybe it would have changed uh, some things had I known. Yeah, that's so interesting that no one ever counted. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. just assumed, we're like, oh, they said 90 seconds, it's probably true, right? Uh, yeah. never shows such blizzard. a clean number, too. Yeah. 75 is just kind of awkward. It's like, why would you go for 5 multiples of 15 instead of 6? So, <laughs> turns out both teams are equalizing, and uh, we're going to be going forward perhaps to you know, a 6-5 series. In the tournament so far, the best score that a team ever had was 6-3, I believe, over their opponents. So we've never had you know, a sweep, a 6-0, or anything along those lines. It's, it's never happened yet. Oh, Trump. Somebody says, weighted randomization only changes by 1-2% to in terms hey. of choosing your deck. I work really okay, well, hard that's for my interesting, one or two percent. I'd be interested in like talking that out with someone because I actually think it doesn't even change it by one to two percent. I think it has zero effect. So Bunny Muffins is saying that. I mean, you probably know him from Ladder, uh, I'd imagine, or maybe yeah, Ladder or some so. tournaments. Yeah. Um, I like I when think... I started. I actually had the um, opinion that choosing the deck that was strongest against their general lineup was best. But after attending some live tournaments and talking with a few players, notably from Cloud9, really, uh, I've kind of been convinced that it makes zero difference what deck order you bring things in in Conquest if you have like similar decks, if you know what the opponent's decks are. Hmm. I don't know. I'm, I've heard all the arguments from everybody, and I think it does give a slight edge still. For the, the weighted randomization. But if you have weighted randomization, then it's fine. As long as but he said 1% to 2%, right? And I think, as a, if you actually, if that's true, and if there's actually a difference, then you'd probably want to go for it. Like, it's, yeah. it's a ridiculous difference, but if you can actually do the... If you can run the math quickly, then I guess it's, it's worth doing. Those little edges... I mean, at high levels of play, like, we're not oh. talking about chess, we're not talking about StarCraft 2, we're talking about a game where variance can matter, and those small edges, I think, when the game is inherently more prone to variance, they mean a lot more in those circumstances. Well, the player that usually wins more consistently, the player that's got the higher win rate overall, is trying to find all of those 1-2%, to and they add up if you go get... If, you're able to hit every 1% to 2% advantage and just get all the possible advantages you can get. At the end of the day, that can make the difference. And uh, it's it also, also important. Does... It's also important to note that the more like matches you play, like this is a best of 11, which is a lot, if you actually get that 1% to 2% advantage, it actually expands out. Uh, your total chance of winning the match isn't just 52%. If, theoretically, you were to get like a... 2% advantage, it would right. be closer to like somewhere between 53 and 55%. Yeah, because you're getting a, like a 4% differential with your uh, your opponent. It's a pretty big deal. Well, Tiller's going to be playing his patron versus Strive Crow's mage, so I guess, I mean, Strive Crow could be bringing his grinder mage type of list. Uh, I know it's something that he favors a lot. I don't know for tournament play how confident he feels that it's going to be very strong, but if oh. it's freeze mage, which we, we've come to expect, then that could be yeah, long. I, mean, I expect he's not going to cheat and change his deck mid-tournament, but if he does, that would be really <laughs> interesting to see, too. <laughs> what do you think, Firebat? Um, I actually think Grinder Mage is pretty good against Warrior, and I know you said Echo Mage is actually good against Warrior, which I do agree with. 
Yeah, I think Grinder Mage is pretty good in this warrior as well, but we already saw Strife Girl play Freeze Mage. Yeah, I'm, I'm just like... Oh, yeah, yeah. The oh, theoretically, yeah. like, well, yeah, what would you think about... Yeah, I think it's pretty solid against uh, Warrior. I mean, it does a similar thing to uh, Echo Mage, same sort of sense. Just blocking down, just taunts and heals. How could that be bad? Taunts, heals, and blocks and stuff. Definitely pretty solid. Because uh, Patron, or any other combo decks, really, they have a limited amount of resources because a lot of their cards are cycle cards, which are cards that generally don't hold very much to any weight in the match, whereas Grinder Mage has just got tons of value cards that are trying to keep you alive and make sure you get as much value out of your cards as possible while your opponent's cutting their deck down in size and you're just playing with more cards than them basically at the end of the day. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because Block does counter uh, Patron Warrior, I would say. Uh, right. It's just that Patron Warrior counters... Well, it's just that Armor counters Freeze Mage, on the other hand. So... Uh, Patron Warrior just happens to get enough armor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets a lot of armor. You can guarantee so much armor with the uh, the double armor smiths, especially. And now the shield blocks are thrown into the standard Patron Warrior for the most part. Mm -hmm. So you got the shield box going for him too. Is so much armor. Yeah, double armor smith is I, I, like it's one of those matchups where you couldn't really play the same way a uh, control warrior does, where they actually just armor up and pass. Uh, very often you have to be sometimes a bit more proactive, but the double armorsmith turn is one that you get even more value out of than Control Warrior even can. Like, they don't have as many AoE effects. So you're very often going to be able to get, like, crazy amounts of armor in Patron. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with the fact yeah. that you get tons of armor, but I do think that you can play Patron Warrior against Freeze Mage and just armor pass like you play against Control Warrior. I mean, like Control Warrior would play against Freeze Mage. Just armor passing a ton and maybe play out, like, one threat at a time, just one minion, and that's like it basically. And just mainly focus on saving your executes for Antonitis and uh, Alex. Alex draws it, yeah. Patron down, Emperor, or weapon it down, or have some other way to kill it. Use a war song. Well, Strife Crow's got Emperor Thorsten already set up, and this hand is looking a tiny bit better than it did previously. I mean, if he picks yeah, up Archmage, just a little bit better, right? Than a double ice barrier, double ice block, and he picks up. Oh wow, Archmage. That's well, pretty good. That's, that's pretty solid. solid. And uh, Tiddler Celestial's hand is not terrible. Uh, he's got some draw, I guess. A little bit, just one card. Yeah, and this I is a small play, but I'm just kind of curious. I might have been tempted to just armor up there because I like using the coin for flexibility later. Uh, what do you think, Firebat? Personally, I would armor there. I would armor pretty much everywhere that I could fit in and armor. <laughs> I'm, my style in this matchup is to just yeah. armor a ton and just take it to fatigue every single time. So that's my play style in this matchup. I've seen a lot of different players play this matchup a lot of different ways, but uh, I really don't see any reason to pressure the Freeze Mage at this point in time. Like, they're not gonna yeah, do Yeah, I guess anything. when you think about it on a grand scale, basically use the coin for two damage, right? Because yeah. it's only, yeah. Two damage. And uh, what does that two damage matter really at the end of the day? If you're gonna pop them, you're popping them from thirty. <laughs> like it doesn't like, matter. Like, like you always do a space train. Although I guess if you're gonna use a cruel task here, maybe it would matter. The thing is, he didn't know he was gonna draw that anyway. So, and if he doesn't armor up here, I'll be very surprised. They're like, there's no reason to rush down your freeze mage opponent. That might have been an interesting line. Uh, Taylor was considering doing taskmaster battle rage there, which mm -hmm. would fit a more tempo style. You get to do more pressure. You get yeah. to drop cards. Yeah. So, there's a, a question I have to have, like, about Battle Rage. Very often you'll see mages not ping the enemy warrior's face because they don't want him to draw, but this is a matchup that goes to fatigue, I guess, more often than not, uh, when played properly by both players. And I, I guess in that case, you really want to make sure that the opponent's health is a 29 instead of 30, or do you prefer not doing it? You know, now that you mention it, uh, I actually didn't notice since the game started so quickly, but... I wouldn't have pinged the opponent's face there. It just gives them that extra option, and it's just one damage. Doesn't seem to matter. You alex them yeah. eventually anyways. Yeah, I don't like it either. It gives them the option to battle rage for two or one if they want, because they can definitely control it and just wait till they have no minions on board after you were, you're forced to AoE down all their board and then battle rage for one if they want. So giving them the option doesn't seem very good. Yeah, and this way, it's almost like Strife Crow gave Tiddler a life tap for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for one damage, not completely free. 
but yeah. pretty much free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost free. Let's just put it that way. If I could take one damage and draw a card, I would all day. Oh, yeah, definitely. Interesting. Let the pain yeah, this is consistent with not playing the Doomsayer last turn. He doesn't want to Emperor. He doesn't feel like he's got enough cards worth Emperoring in his hand. He's probably going to wait for some sort of like Frostbolt, Ice Lance, just guarantee some Fireball generation. Because yeah. you definitely need something to cut through the armor that's going to be gained. Yeah, the Pyro Blast is also pretty relevant. It's nice to have it now rather than later. I don't know. Usually you don't have time to Pyro Blast in this matchup. Like, uh... We'd just be dead too fast? Well, I mean, you gen generate Fireballs. Because like, you always have to generate Fireballs in this matchup. So then after you generate Fireballs, you're going to be going double Fireball every single turn after that. And, uh... You're probably going to hit Fatigue before you run out of Fireballs. At least that's how it usually goes for me, and then I never end up Pyro Blasting because it's 10 instead of uh, 13 damage. But, uh, yeah, usually Pyroblast and Freeze Mage is uh, anti aggro tech, as weird as it sounds. At least that's what I think. Anti aggro, anti mid range, really. Because against control, you want to generate fireballs with Antonitis. And against aggro and mid range, you want to set up states where you can freeze their board, burn their face, freeze their board, burn their face, freeze their board, burn their face, and then Pyroblast them. Yeah, or like you just live over like three turns with double eyes block, and then you finish it off with Pyroblast in the last one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the hand from Tiddler is not that bad. If he picks up an Emperor Thorson, I think this is just going to be disgusting. He needs a second frothing, though, right? Like, ju just to make sure that he gets all that damage in, in one shot. The drawback with that is that then Ice Block becomes even better. So you have to whittle down your opponent's health to a certain point, or a certain point where he's not going to be left with, you know, 22 health after you OTK him or attempt to. Well, that hand is definitely good enough to Emperor Thorson. You've got, like, at least five cards that you want to Emperor there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely good enough. But uh Tiddler should definitely just wait until ten mana before really having to do much. Cause uh you don't have to pop the freeze mage too quickly. Looks like he's just gonna throw out a patron just to throw out a patron so he doesn't overdraw. And while he's at it, make two. Yeah. Some people, like me included, would have actually been very tempted to just Throw in a Taskmaster there? Yeah, I would have done it, but... No, I no, 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 you need the Taskmaster to activate Execute. Oh, man. You need the Taskmaster or the Inner Age, I guess. Whoa! Yes, both. Because you want to save... You don't want to use the Whirlwinds to be forced in a situation where you have to use them to activate Execute, because you want to save them for either A, your lethal combos, or B, your life gain combos. So, without the second Eyes Block... Is there a chance, because right now Tiddler having the patrons already on board could give him a little bit more damage output? Oh my god, okay. Well, he can't play with He can't do it just problem. yet, unfortunately for him, but this is this is looking, this is lining up. Yeah, this is really Tiddler. close. I think is, uh, yeah. he might, uh, it's plus he eight, might be able to pop him. Yeah. This is crazy amount of damage, like double whirlwind. You got the inner rage on top, you can sprinkle up. Uh, on the the thing about thing popping him in this situation, though, is he's not gaining any armor this way. And uh, Strife Girl has a lot of damage in hand. So yeah, that's the only scary thing, you're right. If it doesn't pop him, it's not very good. Well, he must have done the math, because otherwise, why would you go all in on this? Yeah. I mean, there's no... That's, that's not popping him. That's not remotely popping him. So I guess he's forcing Strife Girl to play the Blizzard game or the Flame Strike game as opposed to going for the mana reduction, but since we've already got Emperor, I guess at this point you would generate fireballs regardless. That's kind of... An, wow, okay. So I guess yeah. not having the Armorsmith made Tiddler just decide to go all in on it. I'm actually not that against not yeah. popping them, uh, necessarily, because eventually it seems like in the end game you do this move anyways, and uh, you mostly use the Whirlwind in combination with your stuff to throw in the Execute on a big guy. So sure. even if Tiddler takes this into uh, into the late game, isn't this the same as just pulling this off uh, later? Except well, this way you get rid of the five cards in your hand so you have an easier chance of just drawing stuff. Well, usually when you do this, though, in the late game, you have the armor smith on the field. Like you play it in that turn and then clear their big minion and gain 15 armor. But uh, not having the Armorsmith, I guess he felt like he was forced into a position where he had to go off earlier than he wanted to. But, uh... Yeah, you can do that the second go around, too, I suppose. Yeah, now, now he has one Whirlwind left to go with the Armorsmith. 
which uh, might not be enough armor. Oh, Alex, wow, what a oh, nice that's pick awesome. up. That is sick. That is absolutely sick. Yeah, that is that is just Tiddler's ideal top deck. Like, nothing else would have really... I mean, I guess he could have spawned an additional patron. Yeah, he did have a clear for it. It wasn't going to be yeah. pretty enough. That wasn't going to be nearly as cute as this. And now he's actually... Wait, does he wipe the board? Uh, I mean, not wipe the board, but does he actually pop the block from a really high health amount? Or is he just going to put him in weapon lethal range? Well, I guess he's assuming Strife Crow maybe doesn't have an AoE because this seems like kind of a more desperate play from Strife Crow because if I was Strife Crow, I would think I would have used like an AoE there. Oh, wasn't it worth I popping the block there instead? Well, he is popping. He's setting him to one for Oh, one. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. And he's clearing off a minion so he doesn't have uh, seven minions on board. I really like that. Yeah, it ended up being a pretty good line. If Striker That's... doesn't find the second block, it's going to be in trouble. He could flame strike potentially off the top. Um, right? Like, you just arcane the elect and get a flame strike, you're going to be fine ish. I mean, you're dead to a weapon, but can you really prevent that anyway? I guess the best top deck, well, even then, you're drawing two cards and you're going to mill one of them. I mean, he's got Frost Nova, two Blizzards, one Flame Strike, maybe two Flame Strikes. Yeah. And worst case, he can Scientist Fireball his own Scientist. Oh, here's the take. dilemma right now. But uh, he, he's going to—he's got one draw, though, because he's going to mill one of them. Exactly. So he's thinking about whether or not to play the Scientist first or whether or not he needs to top deck exactly a Flame Strike mm. off the top. Or I guess Blizzard would work, too. Hmm. So you'd have to play Doomslayer first then if you're hoping for Blizzard or Nova. Because that's giving you two draws for a second Nova or Blizzard. And that could be just enough. Oh wow, oh. and that was a second draw. Good thing. Yeah. He did it that way. Well, he's gonna live one more turn, right? Because there's no... Yeah. Well, I mean, Tiddler's got one War X, maybe, because he's already played one, right? So sometimes they only run one War X, and then he's got yeah. uh, the second Death Fight. Fight. And uh, he's got War Song. So he's got three outs, two draws. He could pull it off. It's oh, done. another draw. He another. Still has, <laughs> still has all of those outs available because the unstable goal can be traded. And there it is. Oh, the wow. If he didn't get that there, I think Strife Crow would have stabilized and won that game. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, with the Alex defensive Alex. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. That's the risk of playing Patreon like so aggressively, but maybe he didn't have Armor Smith because we didn't see one and he's just forced to go into that line of play. No armor or, smiths and patron. You see, that would be a really interesting thing. Uh, it's not something that I've seen very often. I've seen some lists with only the one, but yeah, he's got the cruel taskmasters in there. We saw two cruel taskmasters, I think, yeah, and two war X, right? So. And two war X. So he definitely has to be cutting something for sure. And cruel taskmasters and armor smiths serve very similar purposes. Yeah, like uh, against aggressive decks, they ping off one health things, and uh, they often act as an enabler for battle rage because you can just beg something with it, or the armor smith gets. Just sticks around and can get battle rage. Right. So very similar cards. Who would have thought? But like cool Taskmaster equals Armor Smith. Definitely, definitely affects good. that matchup a lot though to not right. have the Armor Smiths. <laughs> it yeah. does. Tiddler played that in a very uh, aggressive and exciting fashion. Glad it worked out for him. Yeah, we'll see the deck list afterwards. You know, they'll be published on the website, so we can always check them out afterwards. I'm really curious to know if, whether or not there were Armor Smiths in there. Because as you said, I mean, the aggressive line of play is not that unusual. Like, I've seen some players play very aggressively. Like, I've seen Kalento drop Frothing Berserkers on turn 3 against Freeze Mage. Like, he's done it, and yeah, you force... Mind. Yeah, like, it'll happen. You force the opponent to have the answer, otherwise you you start uh, chipping away his health slowly but surely. So, it's a little, uh, little bit of a tricky deck to play, I guess. Like, there's so many ways to play those two decks against each other. Yeah, and uh, one of the problems you can run into if you do choose to go the uh, the passive route, so the fatigue them out, gain all the armor route, is if they happen to have some tech cards thrown in there for that situation, like sometimes people have, they drop the Pyroblast and throw in like a Malagos, and then maybe you use both your executes early because you're forced to on like Antonitis and Alex, and then Malagos hits the field and you don't have the, uh, the answer for Malagos anymore because you use both executes, then you can run into really tricky situations. So it's definitely still... A gamble either way you take it. Yeah. So the Warriors are out for both teams, which means we're going to be down to, you know, you, we mentioned the, the top classes. You've got, you know, Mage, Hunter, Warlock. So 
Team Celestial is still ahead, and they've got three of the same classes that Cloud9 has, except now Cloud9 is also forced to win with the Rogue. And as we said earlier, it doesn't really have any clearly amazing matchups here. And knowing that Frozen Ice's Warlock is type of mid-range demon zoo, sort of, uh, do you think do you think that's a bit better than just a pure zoo list for the Rogue player, or worse? Uh, that's worse for the Rogue player. The Rogue player would prefer just cleaner minions that can all die to Blade Flurry, whereas the mid-range demon zoo... You got like a lot of things you want to sap, and then on top of that, if you blade flurry, sometimes Melganis comes out, sometimes Doom Guards start flying out, everything comes back to life. It's like you almost need a blade flurry twice to clear the board. So I think for Rogue nowadays, the best Warlock matchup is Handlock, actually, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, how about that, Trump? What do you think? I know you like Handlock a lot. Like, how, do you feel the same way or? Yeah, whoa. I know uh, last week when Monk was casting, he gave some stats on that Warlock was actually unfavored against Rogue. Something like, uh, I believe he tossed out the statistic of 57% favored for Rogue. And that was a surprise to me because I always thought it was Handlock favored still. Yeah, it definitely changed a lot with the Soulfire nerf, I think. That was really what did it. Because now, uh, before, like Rogue would play their 3-drop and then Handlock would just play Mountain Giant and then Soul Fire the 3-drop and then Rogue would be like, well, crap, now I have nothing I can do. <laughs> but now, they can't do that anymore because Soul Fire now costs 1. So now Rogue is going to have that 3-3 on board that can be pushing damage after the sap or they can buff it to then trade in with the Giant. Because even now, just like the Dagger hit plus Eviscerate is going to be able to kill the Giant. So right. Oh, actually wow. have an answer to it more. And here's the mage versus mage matchup, and he, so basically this boils down to like ice block timings, right? Like I, I've seen Emperor Thorsten be one of the biggest deals, and ice block timings as far as who gets his ice block popped first, without necessarily being in a position where he can start uh, burning the opponent. Yeah, well, well we're it's not really sure. important to realize that Team Celestial is actually one of the teams which hasn't always brought freeze mage. So. Right. Yeah. They've usually they've sometimes brought a tempo mage with Kazan and Ragnaros. Let it be real. If that if that so, is true, then they're gonna have a huge edge here, cause like taking out any of the secrets that Stripe Crow has, and also dropping Rag, which is the worst nightmare of uh, Freeze Mage. Those would be really meaningful. Yeah, definitely extremely strong, and uh, who knows? It would make sense though, like if you think about what they know of their opponents. Given how uh, unoften. Freeze Mage is met on the ladder. I'm actually not sure if it were to be Tempo Mage versus Freeze Mage, which side is favored. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Uh, with I, Kazan and Rag? Or without whenever, Kazan and Rag? Let's uh, say without. Oh, without? I would think it's like 60-40 Freeze Mage favored. Uh, I've met it quite a few times when I'm just like grinding Freeze Mage on ladder. and uh, It feels favored, but it doesn't feel like great. It's not something like a matchup you really like, because... They always run Lotheb, and uh, if they get like a really solid start, it's oftentimes really hard to beat them, and they can answer Doomsayer with just Fireball Ping. So. But you played into Mirantity, and then you're golden. I've seen Tiddler play Mirantity yeah, against yeah. Freeze Mage, and it's like it's backfired more times than I count. So. Yeah, but they they obviously just try and not play Mirantity if they can afford it. Mm -hmm. So. Well, this is Strive Crow. Let's see what Tiddler brought. He he is probably the only player in this league so far that I've seen bring Tempo Mage somewhat reliably, right? It's, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's the Tempo Mage. And I guarantee you it's going to have the Kazan and Rag. Oh, Mech Mage, yeah. Could be Mech Mage. So, now as Tiddler here, do you mulligan away this scientist? Or... The oh, did he already I mulligan? I think he I, must have already mulliganed, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that's a keep still. Really? Still? Yeah, th that's the thing. I think Firebat and I w would probably agree that you really don't want to play Marantity, but Tiddler, every time I've seen him play it, doesn't hesitate one second. He just plays it because he can. I've never really seen him just try to hold on to it into the last ditch effort and, oh man, I'm forced to play this card. He just plays it and gets the Doomsayer out of the way as early as possible, I guess. I'm not sure. Huh. He does that a lot. All right, so now off the spare part here, he is looking to find Reversing Switch. If he gets Reversing Switch, that's actually like a big deal, because if the Doomsayer gets played not into a mirror entity, he can use Reversing Switch and deal with it for one mana. Oh, oh man! Oh. <laughs> that's Insane. strong. Insane. That's, 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 that's,
And, wow. And the worst part is, I guess Finicky Cloakfield is also not too bad if you're playing Archmage and you're trying to get fireballs later on. Um, but, I, I, the reversing switch is just the absolute best. Yeah, yeah those are the big two, for sure. Maybe he uh, runs a counterspell, and uh, he's got a 50-50 to pull a counterspell out of the scientist. Counterspell can be extremely strong against uh, Freeze Mage, denying crucial freezes and such. Oh, oh my he, god. That is an aggressive... Reversing switch. I'm not sure if I really like that because you have Coin Shredder there and just yeah, so much damage immediately. But... I'm not against that. It looks like if you Coin Shredder, you don't have a good follow up. So you're you're looking to curve as much as possible. I guess it's fine because you do get Shredder into Drake into Coin Boom in this specific case. Yeah, there's that lines up to the four five six. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I see it. It's it's yeah, I guess. it's fine. So we're not going to get any Doomslayer action with a reversing switch, unfortunately, for Tiddler. Unless he picks up another spare part later on. Oh! That's a card that can make or break games when that shows up. Yeah. Get the second Lothab. Second Rag, maybe. Mm. Get the Kazan Mystic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Trump, if we see Kazan Mystic here, you are responsible for this. You will be responsible for Tiddler. Just taking this over Strife Crow. And you'll have to apologize to Strife. Yeah. Doomsayer! Alright, what secret is it? It is count. What? There's only one mere entity, and that's it? Wait, what? No, it's gotta be. Is it Ice Block? Oh, it's Barrier, okay. Ice Barrier. But uh, I guess they have Tiddler runs one mere entity, and uh, no other secrets. It's so very unfortunate oh, that he drew it, I guess. Um, maybe he does run more, but... Maybe it is fortunate that he drew it, because it's not in play right now. Well, I've seen him play lists that have an unusual combination of secrets, so maybe he does run two, but... I don't know. So, Strife Crow with the Emperor Thorsten turn could pick up some semi-decent value out of it. But I guess at this point, I mean, you can use Doomsayer as a guaranteed clear anytime Mirror Entity shows up. So I guess you can half rely on that now that you picked up the Doomsayer. So do you just Blizzard and trade into the Drake? Seems fairly solid. It's good to me. Yeah, just slowing down damage seems pretty good. Emperor aggressively doesn't seem bad either. I mean, you get a kill too, too. Ice block, alright. Yeah, he would have probably preferred barrier there, but still. What shows up at that portal could be a big deal. It's Neptulon, wow, that okay. Is... <laughs> That's a I, card. It's funny, at least. I'm not. How effective is it? I mean, at this point, the overload's a really big deal because you really don't want to be using up that three lock mana. But it's a good late game replenisher against Freeze Mage after they've wiped your board countless times. I mean, just look at how many threats are in Tiddler's hand at the moment. He's got Dr. Boom, he's got Antonitis, which can generate two fireballs, and then he can just slam a Nebulon behind that. Like, that's a, so much damage. After the two fireball generations, he's got 18 points of burn. Like, he has almost enough burn just to burn Striker out. And the Boombots might be able to push in the extra damage that he needs to... So, do you keep the boom boss for the last minute? Because that's that's always a question that I that I ask is: Is it worth it to keep the Doctor Boom for the point where the opponent's so low on health that it's just going to kill him if he tries to clear, or do you attempt to just play it, you know, straight up and kill him with Murlocs? For well, in this case, you're just trying to pump out the maximum damage, and Doctor Boom is a lot more damage. Neptulon yeah. is best played at the later stage, just because of the overload. So. It's going to be really hard to justify not Dr. Boom right now. Well, yeah. Dr. That Boom is his mirror entity. So he's already got a mirror entity on the board. Oh, the bad news about that mirror entity is, and Tiddler knows this, uh, the Doomsayer will wipe him out. What to do? What to do? Yeah. Not much you can do about that, though. Yeah, I mean... Your opponent can't really develop that turn, so it's not all bad. 
This is like what a strife crow do behind the uh the dooms here. How oh, interesting that he chooses Antonitis instead. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of good because he can j then use the um, the fireballs to burn his opponent down, and then you play Doctor Boom, forcing the opponent to clear them. And I think that's the situation where he really can't do it because if he does, then you stand just winning the game outright. Yeah, this would be the case for getting this one out instead of the tougher Doctor Boom, just because uh, with Archmage Antonatus you already got the stuff you wanted. Yeah. And yeah. with Dr. Boom, you can play it after the board is clear. Sure, it makes sense. So why the one minute Doom server? Yeah, this I don't know. Okay. I think I would play I, I hate well. when I ask a question to a pro player, and he's like, I don't know. I'm like, something's missing, and I can't get it. Yeah, so, I think that was a misplay. Okay. Yeah, I played it too <laughs> fast because he uh, drew that the happened. Dooms there. Right. It's like yeah. the second one, so he might think it's not going to be a big deal. I mean, maybe it won't be a, uh, either. He should ping his uh, Falnos here, look for like Arcane Intellect or something that he can do with his mana this turn, too. Because like, just floating five mana seems really bad, and yeah. the, the Thalnos is just dying anyway, it's accomplishing nothing. So you're giving up the possibility of a play that turn to deal one damage to the face when you're going to Alex your opponent anyway. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point you're making. Yep, good stuff. Well, the Doctor Boom comes out, and what would he have drawn? He would have drawn Blizzard, so it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But yeah, like, yeah, he drew. Oh, Ice no, he would have drawn Ice Lance, right? Right. Oh, he would have drawn Ice Lance. Yeah. So that well, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But it could have, right? It could have. It could have. <laughs> it definitely could have. Yeah. All right. We'll see what he does here. So, what line of play do you take if you're in Strikeforce position? Because I mean, you have to log down this board in some way. You know, your opponent's got at least twelve damage worth of fireballs in hand. Um. Which means if you play Doomslayer, you you know it's just gonna get fireball pinged. So Doomslayer doesn't feel like a play you ever really want to make. Looks like he's gonna try and absorb some damage here and get Antonitis fireball pinged. I don't mind that play. And he's gonna set up for possible board clear with maybe flame strike or blizzard ping. Yeah, I was actually just thinking, Strife Crow's position looks really tricky to navigate and actually get a win out of here. Yeah. You kind of need Alex Straza to... If you get Alex, this is almost an autopilot win. But if you don't find her... Yeah. I really like the, the line he took by uh, forcing his opponent to use one of the fireballs. Because when your opponent only has two fireballs instead of three, the situation looks a lot better than it did before, so... Just getting that out of the hand immediately seems good. So we could see a blizzard ping on Dr. Boom, but then you can't arc in it like just yet. Uh, I kind of like just maybe like Doomsayer and then Blizzard and then force him to get the other fireball out of the way. But you know, that's kind of not the greatest. He has enough burn to win the game. He has 28 points of damage. So if he felt Did like you, uh, he was the Doomsayer before or after the boom bots? Depends I'd on what they hit. Or... Like, your Doomsayer is 100% going to die anyway to the fireball. So if you can just get it to soak up some boom bot damage, I think it's really good. But like, just this way, if you get your opponent to waste their other burn spell, then uh, or skip a turn, either is really good for you. And then uh, you have enough damage to just win the game. So if you can get any situation where you can stall out to where you can get another... If you get a second block, you win, or... You're just getting free turn to double fireball face, you win. So removing damage from your opponent seems really strong, but Nephulon's gonna throw a wrench in that plan. <laughs> well, let's see where that goes. So what Murloc did he get? He did, he got pretty good ones. He got the Tide Caller, yeah, it gets nice bust. Set. One that gets more health to all the Murlocs, and the War Leader on top of it to make uh, the Murloc boy really scary. He's gonna be able to play everything, unfortunately. Like, the Puddle Stomper is gonna stay there, but still. So, he's looking at uh, 28 damage in hand. If he wants to go for it, I guess he could try. He's got a second block, so I think that's... Strifeco can take this right now, right? Unless a counterspell oh. shows up. Well, he does need three turns. Uh, yeah, it looks like he'll get three turns. Yeah, he can, he can kill him, yeah. So, now he Actually, needs... Actually, does he get three turns? Hmm. I, with the yeah, ice block, I think yeah, he Yeah, he double fireball, ice box, and the fireball. Yeah, he needed... Like uh, a freeze. Exactly that card. Fireball. No, no, he had a lot out. Yeah. That's why he was setting up the Doomsayer, force the fireball out of his hand, just stall for one more turn to find find it. But, 
And it's interesting that uh, Tiddler didn't try to Arcane Intellect that turn. But could he Arcane Intellect and still pop? I thought he could. Maybe not. I think he didn't attack with one of the Mana Worms, and the Flame Waker did two damage. Yeah, yeah. Because I felt like he could Arcane Intellect and tried to find Lotheb or a heal bot. And oh, now no. Is this the moment where Tiddler plays Ice Block in that weird <laughs> mid-range mage? Because I remember he had a list, it was just the craziest thing. On Lothab, come on Kazan Mystic. Well, Lothab doesn't, even Lothab doesn't Lothab. matter though. He would He's get just Kazan. So hard. And Kazan would be so... But, hey, oh, Kazan actually, never mind. Because of the Flame Waker. <laughs> oh no, if he oh. finds Kazan Mystic off the top, I'm going to cry for him. Oh, that's so sad if he does. What oh if it's kind of out of the yeah, portal? <laughs> Vitality totem? Come on, a healing spell. Get a heal bot. Heal bot. It's happening. He's going for it. I guess. He has to try it. There's no chance otherwise. And that's absolutely it's not GG. what he's looking for. Yeah. Like, what could have worked? Is there, like, healing could have worked. Any type of healing would have worked here. Yeah, like, any type of healing. Voodoo doctor, doctor would have worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about Voodoo Doctor as a win condition is hilarious. Although I did get Shrek by double Voodoo Doctor and Challenge Stone, so I guess I've got nothing to say. Alright, well, that's a pretty good win. Yeah, Strife Crow definitely navigated that very well out of a tricky position. His opponent was able to get so much burn that was really threatening him. So like any board state that uh, his opponent had was threatening to pop him. And then yeah. he was able to just find enough burn there to really deal with it. And that was sort of how I was talking about earlier, how I thought Pyroblast is really good against aggressive slash mid range decks. And we saw there, it just gives you the potential right. that decks that don't have heal, non control decks, you can just burn them out like that. Definitely adds another win condition that's really strong when you don't find your Alex. Uh, it's like yeah, it was so well navigated. Like, Strathcrow managed to finish with just exactly the last block and just the right amount of damage and used up mm -hmm. all of his cards. Very elegant. Yeah. That's a beautiful game when people just get exactly told as Freeze Mage. It's like, those are the, the games I think that I like the most. Um, is watching Freeze Mage set up a lethal over the course of five, six turns, and you know that that's what's in their head. Uh, well, Strife set that up just... like, so long ago, because remember that yeah. one time where he just, uh, he like pinged face at like a really weird time and we said it was probably a misplay? Right. That, oh, yeah, that that's right. Set up lethal. That was like turn six or something, like random like that. And uh, if he didn't do that, he didn't have enough damage to win. So he knew at that point that he was going to generate two fireballs out of Antonitis, and he already had the Pyroblast in hand. Then he had the 18 from the two fireball. He had Pyroblast, Fireball, and then he knew he was going to generate two fireballs off Antonitis, and that ping was required there for lethal. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had the lethal. Right. So, yeah, that ping that, that was we thought really was good. That was maybe really good. a misplay was actually setting up the lethal. Yeah, we said he should have picked Blood Mage Thalnos. I mean, knowing yep. that uh, <laughs> he didn't, like, he did not doing this basically gave him the lethal. He had the outs of top decking the second ice block that he wanted to stay alive in case that happened, and yeah, Alex draws offensively as well. Yeah, any freeze spell or the second ice block would do it there, so, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. So, onwards to the, the remaining games. We've got Mage Hunter Warlock for Team Celestial, and Cloud9's got Rogue Warlock Hunter. So the only difference is, of course, between the Mage and the Rogue. Um, we, we keep speaking of that Rogue as the potential weakling for Cloud9. Uh, we'll have to see whether or not that, that comes true. Yeah, I don't no, think... But speaking of weak links, uh, Ecob's Hemlock deck is now looking pretty weak against Freeze Mage, against Face Hunter, and against Zoo, which is like kind of close. Do we know his face yet? I, um, no, no, but sure. it's just a guess. Even <laughs> I if like it's mid-range, though, I like the this. matchup is still poor. Right. Yeah, I think mid-range Hunter is poor. better against Handlock than Face Hunter than is. Face. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they just have so much more burst with like high mains and huge creatures. So we got Warlock versus Blank. It's a mystery to all. Oh, oh Warlock, Warlock Mirror Match. That's well, good right. news for you, Ecop, if he's running Handlock, because this is probably the best matchup he could have gotten. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And he's pretty good at the Handlock as well. It's one of the decks that he's piloted since the dawn of time, basically. Yeah. So, if he has got some tech cards to maybe help this matchup, yeah. then it could be a lot better. But other than that, it's usually like 55 60 in favor of uh, Handlock. Yeah, you know, with that face, if you told me Ecop was a warlock in real life, I'd probably believe you. Yeah, it, it looks more like a hunter face. 
Oh my god. Uh, that's oh. what I think of when I face off against uh. the scumbag hunters. Do you oh. wake up and sweat in the night? You're like, he cop, no, don't hunter me. Did that happen <laughs> ever? No. It's a scary face. I mean, e I think, is just basically... He's been around for so long, but somehow... Um, you don't see him in as many tournaments as some of the, the more prominent players at the moment. Oh, boy. Ugh, what is this hand? That's... What a great hand, Kappa. Yeah, not the greatest. How's that? It looks like it's going to be zoomed. Whoa! Okay. e is playing... Well... Yeah. I've seen e play Zoo a lot. The one drop off the top is really good here. I would definitely go one drop into, like, Coin Imp Gang Boss. Imp Gang Boss out early is uh, one of the strongest yeah, things. Yeah, but you don't know you don't know what it is. You have no idea what Ecop's playing. If he's playing uh, a handlock, I guess at least you're forcing a coil off curve. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, you just get punished really huge by this juggler now. Well, not like really huge cuz like the juggles actually kind of work in your favor, right? Generate more one ones. So I guess it's not all bad. And just saving yeah. the abuse of allows you to trade up with things. So I don't mind it. Yeah, also I cop would have played the void walker that I top deck instead. Mhm. Mm Ooh, okay. Put this apple on your head. Now the double juggler opener into implosion. Yeah, this this is gets ugly now. You've got to make wouldn't... the trade, right? Or do you? Oh, I think I would have been I tempted to just play Voidwalker. Yeah, I would yeah. just play Voidwalker. The two knives will compensate for the fact that extra one ones get spawned, basically. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, probably can... uh, kill off one imp with the uh, knife juggler. Know. Because he's afraid of spawning an extra imp and hitting face with the other knife to where what happens is that they kill the Voidwalker and then you lose one of the jugglers to the one ones and he keeps his imp gang boss. That's like the one circumstance you're really going to be in trouble with if that happens. Ooh. Yeah, I guess as a spectator you just become more hopeful. You go for the dream that you have two knife <laughs> out in the explosion. Right. But well, when you're actually playing the game, you have slightly more sane thoughts. I know, right? Either way, the juggles are like two thirds in your favor to be positive. Like if you leave the imp gang boss up, you have, either, you have a, you can either hit the one one imp or you can hit the face, and then either of those are like extremely positive for you. So either way, it's two thirds. That's an unfortunate hit. Uh, if that had hit the juggler, this would be a crazy swing. Right. But yeah, only thirty three percent chance. This is just a disgusting implosion here. Yeah, this is like oh, the game. Yeah, that was a big swing. <laughs> <laughs> because if it hit, then uh, this board wouldn't be clear. Esports. Yeah. All right, three. It's not it too may bad. Not be clear. If the two one, that's a big deal. Oh my yeah. god. It it oh. didn't. <laughs> it got close. It got close. Yeah. By the way, uh, flame juggler. Does that see play anywhere ever? The new card that's coming out. That's like a one-time juggler. Two mana, two three. Two mana, two three. There was a knife. What? There's an idea. You know, one time you summon a minion? No, just uh, when it comes into play. Oh. So it's that like crap a that came out. You haven't seen it, have you? Yeah, I haven't seen it. No. Hey, okay. hey, it's not crap. It's a fair card. But yeah, it's, it, it is fair. Card. It's a little weak when yeah, you're it's running. It's not broken. Uh, Ecop's face is currently amazing, by the way. I'd like to point <laughs> out this is typical Ecop. There's yeah, a camera. You just uh, you can't get a picture of him that's not something like this. I think that's fitting right now, given how this game has gone. <laughs> that's about the face you'd be making. Oh man, this is a clown fiesta. I think I you have to play color here. Like, it's pretty tempting to try and go for the implosion to try and fight for board, but right like, at best, like at best, the board's pretty much even anyway. So I think you just gotta have to go with this and hope you pull the imp gang boss out. Well, if you get the knife juggler implosion on turn six as well, I mean, holding those two cards is going to be pretty solid. The fact that you top that you've got the juggler now uh, really will improve the value of that implosion later. Yeah, definitely. Instead of throwing it out right now, so. So now, here's a situation that comes up a lot in zoom years. Ecop has the ability to use his one ones to take down this void caller, but is it actually worth it? Because there's a huge risk involved in killing it, and then there's also a huge risk involved in trying to race because he doesn't really have any damage. Yeah. But if you race, the worst that could happen is you're forced to re-equalize the board, I guess. Yeah. Personally, here, I think I would just... Uh, oh, wow. What on earth? I think I would have tried so, to just race and just go all face and play the Void Caller. Oh, wow. He gets lucky with the RNG here and gets the Flame of out instead of the game. You know, Ecop is a very good Zoo player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I would have gone Void Caller. Actually, I'm not sure if you said void color, fair bet. 
Yeah, yeah, void caller and then just go all face. Yeah, and then sometimes the void caller can't even trade because it has mm-hmm. four health. Yeah, exactly. Because if like Malganus comes out there and you're forced to run your entire board into it, then suddenly Ika, or then suddenly Frozen Ice has the initiative there, and that's like a risk you don't really have to take. Even Doomguard's a problem because like you're just looking at the health total at that point. So yeah, yeah it would have been a really big problem if either of those had come out. So Frozen Ice has got to be looking at this knife juggle implosion and be like, okay, I need to live until next turn. So yeah. I have to play the Imp King boss. Um, but then he has this second thought about, oh, am I actually going to live that long? And am I just going to implosion now instead? It just seems too tempting, given that board to wait a turn. So I think yeah. boss tap. Wow. Tap. Boss tap. And then... Yes. So Ikop is going for the emotes. Okay. I guess. I mean, tapping's so awkward. You only got one white collar left in the deck, and yeah. you got a Doom Guard in your hand already, so is tapping even worth it? And that's I, kind I of the know. debate he just had. Yeah, I don't know either. It's, it's really like, I was thinking about it, and I'm like, you need the health a little bit, and drawing a card might just be a drawback. Yeah, exactly. Like a lot of the time. You, so. you might pitch it with Doomguard anyway, especially mm-hmm. since you only had one Void Caller to hope for. I don't really like the placement of the Death Rattle minion there. But he's already used two implosions, so I guess it doesn't matter. How much phase do you expect? All phase, pretty much, at this point? Maybe kill the 1-1 one, one Imp? Yeah, you probably kill the 1-1 one, one Imp. Justify doing that. But, uh... Yeah, that would block it from getting Defender of Argus and mm-hmm. trading up, I guess. Yeah. And this is the moment of truth. Is Frozen Eyes going to be able to pull off a good juggler implosion? This is a really big deal. Yeah, you could actually take board back here. Yeah, I would have killed a direwolf first, maybe, though. Well, he can, like, he's trading into the direwolf with the. Yeah, the, the yeah I would have done that first, too. Luckily yeah, for him, none it. of the juggles hit that. <laughs> wow, his juggles wow. were awful. Boo. Terrible juggles. Unbelievably bad. Yeah, and definitely that's cool game. Match. Top deck Doom Guard for the lethal. That's gonna seal it. E Cobb's gonna take the game, and uh, Cloud Nine's gonna race ahead by one point. I don't know if I can say race ahead at that point, but race ahead with one point over their opponents. Wow, the BM. He's gonna do every card in his hand. He's gonna actually kill the Void Caller to summon the Doom Guard to win. This is this is the worst. This is such. A disheartening moment. <laughs> then the tap. Oh my god. Twist the knife. Man, what if he tapped first and it pulled out the flame? That would have been funny. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been amazing. And the next thing you know, Frozen Eyes top decks, like the perfect outcome. Yeah. Somehow. He gets Void Caller, taps, gets Barbwhelming, and then Malganus comes out. Oh man. Well, that's game for Ecop. He's actually sealed the game with his Warlock. Still, Still, Cloud9 with a rogue, right, in the lineup. Yep. We have that's to see the, how that performs. That's the one. And uh, They'll put last, you think? Yeah, I don't know how long you wait on it, but it doesn't really matter, actually, the ordering at this point. I don't think anyway. Well, tiebreaker matters, I guess. That's the one thing is they want to get the most points they can, uh, the game wins. True, true. So waiting so, for it last makes sense for the tiebreaker yeah. points. Yeah, I can yeah, understand if, that. If he cops running a face hunter, that could actually also be a liability. Uh, wait, never mind. To die no, face the freeze mage. Well, freeze mage is uh, favored against face hunter. Right, right. But I was like, oh, never mind. Tiddler isn't running freeze mage. Oh, oh yeah, he's not running freeze mage. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Makes sense. Well, tempo. Like, how bad is it against? Cause I, if, I get a feeling tempo mage can actually compete with face hunter. Although Sometimes. they don't get the. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, I think Flame Waker is a big deal in that matchup. If you can get like one decent Flame Waker, yeah, Temple Mage a... is competitive against uh, both of those decks. Not great, but not bad. 
Yeah, Tempo Mage is like extremely inconsistent just because they have a lot of cheap spells, they have a lot of spells, and uh, they oftentimes can miss their curve, and that's like a huge trouble for them. Like their only one drops are like the Clockwork Gnomes, which are kind of weak, and it's oftentimes a one of, and then two Mana Worms. So they only have three minions at one cost, and then for twos, they have like the Scientist and Sorcerer's Apprentices, and that's it. So like sometimes they can just totally whiff on their one, two, three curve, and then if they don't have any minions in the early game, they don't put on the pressure they need to make their other cards actually do anything. What are we talking about Mech Shaman? It's kind of the yeah. same thing, right? Like it, yeah. I get the feeling it, it gets the exact same problem where you don't find that Cog Master. Uh, it's not like you have Clockwork Gnome on the back end. Yeah, just that's the nature of those sort of decks. They're very, very similar. Yeah. So Warlock against the Hunter. Uh, this is the matchup Ika probably was looking for the most with his Hunter. Zoo struggles against every form of hunter, especially yeah. Demon Zoo. It's slowed down so much that it can uh, not really compete with the hunter usually. Well, I think the classic Zoo is actually okay against midrange, like the the typical Zoo, yeah, not yeah. so much the Demon One. But when you start looking at the Demon variants, then yeah, that's a really big problem. Yeah, the classic Zoo had the advantage that uh, Freezing Trap wasn't really that much of an issue. Mm -hmm. But Demon Zoo, the Freezing Trap can often be a huge problem. Yeah. And uh, there goes the hand. All right, so it's not like a bad start. I guess you, you mulligan most of the stuff in the hand, so you're oh, no. more likely... Uh, the good thing is you're not going to get Dr. Boom back. So yeah. good, good on that, I guess. Yeah. I don't even like keeping Direwolf Alpha. Like, it's your one kind of playable card, but mm -hmm. coining out a Direwolf Alpha does not sound good. You want to get Haunted Creeper. Oh, yeah. boy. Oh, that's like... That's a half, oh, that's half got good. Got Creeper. It's bittersweet. This is a bittersweet hand, really. You need Void Caller to make this viable. Yeah, Void Caller. You get a Void Caller, and the hand turns extremely good. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Even still, if he gets a knife juggler, that's even better for now. Anyway. Oh my God! He up with the face. You know, I think you're right, uh, Trump. <laughs> you you had the right of it. <laughs> you absolutely did. Well. Ecop's yeah. hand's not stellar, so... <laughs> oh, this face. You know, I can't actually dissociate this face from Face Hunter ever again. I might have to make a custom <laughs> hero, like, modify the game files and just have this as my Hunter avatar forever. Uh, it looks uh, like Frozen Ice is gonna really hope he top decks a two-drop if he's making this play. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. There's, like, no other choice against Face Hunter. Yeah. You hope those one ones can carry. If there's Any a Knife Juggler, you really are looking for the, uh... Oh, wow. Oh, good draw from Ecop. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's really solid there. If he what didn't draw that, I think he would have had to probably hero power. That's pretty, pretty solid, actually, right now. There's no abusive sergeant, no eagle horn bow, no glaive zooka to handle it, so that Voidwalker is being a bit of a roadblock. Yeah, yeah. Voidwalker, one of the best cards to draw in space on it for sure. Yeah, even off curve is still really strong, protecting those 1 1 spider things. Still not a great draw. I mean, I guess yeah, it, you have to take it anyway, walker. right? You, you kind of have to take the the juggler worgen, or do you just worgen? Yeah. I mean, if you kill a one one, the opponent's in trouble. Like if that knife hits a one one, the juggler is somewhat safe. Yeah, fifty fifty. Yeah. Well, Whoa! Go the kill command wow. line. Not there really a fan is. of this, but. Okay. Uh, he's just trying to maximize the value of his creeper. Interesting ah. line. Um, guess he intends to fight for board control a little bit longer. Yeah, with uh, a with a play like this, I think you're right. But you, can you compete with M Gang Boss for board control as a face hunter? No, not really. Like it's not really happening. Yeah, I really don't like that line. Would have liked to see it. Like just the juggler and the worgen, at least is. Uh, 50-50 for the juggler to be a huge problem and deal with the Voidwalker. And then even if it doesn't, like you got the Worgen that can deal with it. And then just keep pushing damage. Oh, maybe it's Hybrid Hunter. You see the Lothab Yeah, the Lothab coming up. It's either... Yeah, it's looking like Hybrid, but Worgen Infiltrator is Hybrid isn't exactly the most common card. Very often that's one of the ones that, get, that gets cut. Um, yeah. But not systematically. Face Hunter with Lothab is definitely a deck that we've seen a few times. It's mm -hmm. not bad. Life juggler is pretty And solid. this this could just be so solid for frozen ice. 
Yep, aim true, knife juggler. I would never not juggle here. It's too good to pass. Ooh, Argus is a pretty solid pickup. Yeah. If that worgen dies, Ecop Salt will reverberate through time, but it doesn't die, so I guess we'll find. Yeah, um, looks like he's gonna have to load up and then trade off the juggler. Not really much else he could do there. But that Doom Guard is. I mean, I guess the moment you find Unleash the Hound, though, if the board gets flooded somehow, you're kind of back in the game since you've kept that juggler. Maybe that's the reason he's been holding on to it, hoping to get that. Uh... Ooh, he loses Melganus. That's kind of a bummer. But at least he keeps the keeps the Argus. That's like the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one, it produces taunts, which saves him. Two, if there's an explosive trap, it's going to be allow to, the Doom Guard to push for six, which is a real big deal. Yeah, that almost looks like that looks like a disaster losing the two biggest cards. But in this matchup, you kind of that was almost the best result. Yeah. Do you think he's going to try to empty his hand to give the quick shot value or what? This is looking a bit weird because I, I get the feeling he was going to play the juggler based on the the hover, but how good is that of a play? Uh, I don't know. Oh. I wouldn't have mind seeing like Blade Zuka and then just hero power. Hero power. Blade Zuka yeah. go face and hero power, and then uh, just quick shot off the Doom Guard and just take your time with it a little bit more. I guess just keep. Grinding him out, but uh, because that Doom Guard, the damage from that's gonna matter, and you know the the zoo yeah. just lost Melganus and just lost the second Doom Guard, so like, how big of a board can they really get? Eventually, you're gonna draw into your unleash. You're gonna be able to knife juggler unleash. You're gonna be able to do have explosive yeah. traps and stuff. That's what I thought his line of play was like keeping that juggler from the earlier play where he didn't work in. I figured was because he was hoping to get unleash value, but it's looking like he doesn't want to. And now frozen ice with the second defender, that's gonna lock down the board against Face Hunter. Yeah, the second defender is pretty huge. Yeah, and kill command's gone. At least one of the two is gone, so... That, that is not a good. Lot of damage. Hey, speaking of the devil... Well, Ecop still has a ton of damage. And the important thing is it's damage that can go through taunt. But is it gonna be enough? I get the feeling Iron B. Cal would have been just a game winning card to find, just to use a litter point, maybe. Like, right now, Iron B. Cal would be good, because you could basically ignore the board and hope you can race. Yeah, oftentimes you start racing in this matchup earlier than even Ecop started racing, because he didn't start really racing until after the Lothab. Yeah. This is kind of a tough decision, too, on whether or not you kill the knife juggler. Like, your opponent's at such a high life total that you can't burn them down, but instead the knife shot is going to do so much damage, and yet, if you don't hit the face, you aren't going to have enough damage. Eh, tough times. And you could draw with quick shot as well. Yeah, I mean, if you're changing your mind, though, killing the knife juggler now, that's so inconsistent with how oh you dealt with the Doom Guard last turn by, like, right. saving the quick shot and throwing away your knife juggler. Like, these lines are very wishy washy. You should have really. Yeah, they're Take not following each other. Uh, I see what you mean. Like he, he looked like he was gonna go for a specific game plan and then switch halfway through, and now suddenly, the his opponent's not as low on health as he might want it to be. Yeah. Oh well. Well, the game plan changes because the opponent played taunt, right? You can't get through taunt. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I feel Face like. Has taunt. <laughs> If you're going to use burn to control the board, you should have done it on the Doom Guard turn instead of using your face to control the board. That's going to give you extra time to get more hero powers and you can grind him down with hero powers. Melganus is gone, so that's definitely a win condition in this matchup now, is just being able to grind your opponent down with hero powers. Because your hero power does two damage to them every turn, and if they're going to keep up with you on board, they have lower value cards and they're required to deal two damage to themselves every turn. So you can just grind them out that way a lot of times, I feel. Melganus gone. And the second Doom Guard. Like, he's so low on threats, he has, like, Dr. Boom left in his deck, and that's the only threat. So. Yeah, this board is not one that I see Ecop recover from, like, anytime soon. Unless, I mean, Mad Scientist could get Explosive Trap, and... Yeah, that's gonna be two damage. You can run it into the 3-4 to stop three damage, and... Uh, right. Stall out for more turns. So Ecop is definitely still in it, especially if he finds it Unleash the Hound. Definitely. Um Oh wow. Well That's gonna be tough. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> well, I mean it's 
It's still it's possible, seven. but you've got look at the damage, damage on Boar. I think the boom boss would be enough if an explosive yeah, trap shows yeah. up. So, yeah, yeah, you're likely dead. <laughs> likely. Yeah, some hesitation just because Frozen Ice is thinking, "Oh, what about the doggies?" But he'll be all right. Yeah. That's so, funny because Eco. Is there a quick shot shenanigans that could happen? No. Nope. Quick shot into quick shot into arcane shot. <laughs> would that even. Yeah, it would do it actually because you could actually hero power on the back of that and then mad scientist, but you can't empty your current hand, so. Masterful. Actually, he would have been able to do it. That would have been so crazy. Yeah, he's already I mean, used one quick shot, though. Six, so it was impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Ikab's gonna lose this one, and Frozen Eyes is gonna walk away with the win. Equalizing yeah. again, basically. Typically, that's the mistake like, there was Ikab forgot to hit the face. Yeah, not enough well, more. He the, the mistake wasn't that he forgot to hit the face. He hit the face sometimes, and then other times controlled the board. He needed to pick one of two lines. You can't just distribute your damage like that because if you distribute your damage evenly between two things then neither of them are dead the board's still there kinda and then the face is still there kinda and then you're screwed you need to pick one and kill it you're so, a hunter <laughs> so what, what you're saying firebat is go face at all times right i think the better line was since melganus was pitched to just slowly grind out the game and uh, okay. avoid taking the face damage there but he took an extra five he did a bunch of things but then even that line since the dr boom was drawn i think would have lost him the game so i think he still would have lost even if he had done it that way. But if he went all Smork, because he happened to draw, like, I think both kill commands that game and yeah. one quick shot and, like, all of the damage, if he went full Smork and just never hit anything besides the face, I think he might have actually won. Which I think is the lower percent line, but would have happened to work based on the draws. Okay. So, it's definitely not an easy game to play out because it's so, all the little... I play, I play, I play Hunter very often, and all you say right now is very confusing to me. Uh, did what you say, like what you just said right now? Did you just say go face? <laughs> yeah, in, in simple terms, but like it's really hard to be able to read that board and be able to distinguish whether or not you can afford to control the board or not. Or yeah, go of, face. Course, of course. And yeah. I think controlling the board is a higher percent line because he's only got one Doctor Boom. That's the only threat left in his deck, and you can oftentimes, if he doesn't get it in the next three or four draws, you can burn him out in time while controlling yeah. the board. I think it's very safe. And, uh, and that's funny because... To, the, on top of that, you have to not draw Unleash the Hounds or Explosive Trap, which would have minimized so much damage if he ever drew Unleash the Hounds or Explosive Trap. Well, he could so, have killed at least like two minions on the board with Unleash alone. And I, you know that Knife Juggler that we saw him keep earlier um, was also a card that I expected him to keep just for that Unleash. Like I thought that was his game plan at that point. As you said, you know, keeping the board clean and trying to grind down the opponent with a hero power. Yeah. Um, which he didn't but, do. So we'll see. Was able, yeah. to, was nice, was able to draw the uh, the Doctor Boom in time and be able to win that matchup. All right. Well, next up we've got Rogue Hunter versus Hunter Mage. We've got to figure out. Well, I'm guessing they're gonna go for the Hunter on yeah, Cloud Nine side again and hope that they can grab a win against either of Coin Flip ish, um, since both are likely playing some kind of face deck, and against Freeze Mage uh, against Temple Mage. You said it was somewhat favored to play the hunter. Yeah, I think it's somewhat favored. It that seems to be consistent with the uh, the line they that uh, Cloud Nine's been doing, which is just kind of like saving Rogue because that's the most flippy of their decks for last, and just making sure they can get all the possible points that they can get, and then queuing up the Rogue. But strategy, right. hit face. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, buff taunt? Yeah. No. <laughs> Alright, so they're going to queue up the rogue here. That's pretty good. Avoids the bench rule in case Ekop was to lose. So. Against the mage. Well, Temple Mage versus Rogue. Well, that's actually a really tricky match. Because I remember Mech Mage was a bit awkward to navigate as Rogue sometimes. Um, but that's a completely different deck they've got nowadays. So when they play the Temple variant, it's not as reliant on mechs anymore, so... Yeah, I think it's really going to come down to if the rogue has backstabs and SI7 agents early. Because the like, rogue can oftentimes like, shut out the board really quick. That is a really solid hand from mm -hmm. I mean, Shredder could be a bit of a liability, assuming you're running to Mad Scientist on Rare Entity and you can't really negate it. 
Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him throw that away, but the prep sure. SI is just so good. Ooh, double prep can run into problems if he's unable to find some decent spells to go with it. Well, prep coin, prep sprint. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting that you said it was a solid hand. I do agree the prep and SI was solid. Do you? Uh, would you have kept either of the other ones, Sap, Shredder? No, but I mean, like in Rogue, there's so few cards that you actually want early that having two of them is really good. Because Rogue's often a deck that mulligans all four cards. Hmm. So if you have two cards that you keep as rogue, you're feeling pretty good about your life. Yeah. Well, Tiddler is looking at two Flame Wakers. Not exactly stellar in this specific case. They're not really going to be able to get initiative on whatever they end up doing uh, with the pings, but they're they're some of the better early game or like mid game cards they can get. He just needs to pick up like a mirror image to really make it shine. Yeah, the problem with this tempo mage is uh, you have to draw the right cards at the right time. And like you said, yeah. Max, the Flame Maker is kind of a mid-game card, and this is still the early game. So when you just play it as a 2-4, it's pretty weak. Yeah. yeah, when the tempo mage misses their 2-drop, it's like always pretty gross. So, and they have like such a high percent chance to do it. But the tempo mage is one of those decks where if they hit their 1-2-3 curve, they can often be just like completely unstoppable, like so much power back into them. Yeah. So inconsistent. Yeah, it's such a big deal to miss the two drop because then you can't pl protect the Flame Waker from the agent. If you had a Sorcerer's Apprentice out, then you just uh, kill the agent and then your Flame Waker remains a big threat. But as stands, the Flame Waker might just die for free. Yeah. So you play Mirror Entity here, I guess it's as good a turn as any. And, uh,. Yeah, you kind of have to. Yeah, I guess, I guess there's really no alternative. Flame Waker is just a sacrifice. Well, uh, I mean, Flame Waker sets up for the other Flame Waker because the SI7's health is probably reduced down to one. But I think I like Mirror Entity better. So, yeah, the you're usually like, going to get better than a 2-4. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. I mean, Rogue has the South Sea deckhand, but that's like it for proccing that. And I guess Thalon knows. So, Mirror Entity is often not the easiest thing for Rogue to deal with until the later games. Later game, they can just play anything and then play Flurry. Alright, Secret popped. Yeah. Now he's just trying to evaluate whether he can afford to push face or not. And it looks like he's deciding he's going to play around. Uh, some sort of removal slash buff. That's a nice pickup for Diddler. He's gonna be able to wait to really get maximum value out of the Flame Wakers. Perhaps even wait for a turn where he can play both at once and then play a one cost spell. Uh, or wait for the Vile Teacher to try to control her a little bit. Mm -hmm. mm, that sounds pretty tasty. <laughs> sounds <laughs> bad for sure. All right, what do we want to see here? Like, what completely crazy two drop are we looking for? Lore Walker Cho? I don't think we're going to see one. I think we're uh, going to dodge and just go face. Maybe. Okay. No, oh, man. Like let it let it be Cho. Let it be Cho. Oh, no, my Cho. goodness. Ooh, that's awkward. <laughs> this is well, weird. He gets seven missiles, so this maybe just got he can kill really it. Weird. Not yet. Oh, never mind. Oh, if this hit, wipes the board. Hit. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> And down goes the Flame Waker to the 2-draw that was given by the Shredder. Why did he taunt the Flame Waker instead I don't of get it. The... I, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to ask Stiddler. I think he realizes his mistake. He could have just taunted the Annoia Tren again. Like, double taunted it. <laughs> yeah. And now Kalento... Turns out sometimes you don't want a minion to have taunt. Oh, yeah. I mean, now <laughs> the Annoia Tren's purpose is completely wasted. Yeah, Tiddler's shaking his head. He realizes now. Yeah, no, he definitely knows that he misplayed. You could see it the moment he did it, he realized, wait, what did I just do? That made no sense. Yeah. Oh, Kalento's in a commanding position here. Because there's no more spells to enable the Flame Waker, Tiddler's gonna have to waste two of his mana to deal with those minions, which is ridiculous when you consider the fact that they were supposed to die for free, and now he's gonna have to waste tempo on it. Well, I mean, Tiddler can still draw, like, an arcane intellect or a mere entity to then be able to play with the flame waker and possibly RNG them down again. But uh, yeah, I definitely like uh, Quanto's spot here. I could even see maybe even prepping out an oil and just pushing damage, but I think Deadly's a little better. So much damage coming in. Yeah, the, these next few turns for Quanto are going to be disgustingly high damage if the minions live. 
If the minions actually stay up, that's could, that could be very dangerous. Oh man, eight damage pushed in. Yeah, next turn he can get six from each oil, so that's Ugh. fifteen out of hand. So plus the earthen ring, that's one damage off lethal. So you could play mad scientist ping out the five one. That's usually like a typical line of play because if keeping that flame waker with the fireball means that if violet teacher comes out, you can fireball her and maybe get rid of the one ones. I guess. And now Kalento yeah, just sets Tiddler down to help. Yeah, you just set him down to one. Then Tiddler's forced to freeze you for every turn of the game. Or not. Or not. <laughs> I mean, now you have the surprise factor behind it, so that's good, too. My eyes are open. But yeah, if Tiddler's I mean, able to clear your board and now the oils can't hit, it gets kind of awkward. Oh, and he's killing the scientist. I guess it's just going for the later term play. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like how does Tiddler win if he's at one health? Like rogue and he <laughs> I, just I would him. tend to. I would tend to agree with that. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah. Like, how does he win? That's a that's a good feeling. So, what is he looking for? Uh, oh well, that wow. helps. That is a crazy outcome. It's not bad. <laughs> oh man. I guess that would have stopped. Oh no, he would have top decked the eviscerate and still had it. Yeah. Yeah, he might have lethal here. Yeah, I think he does. Yeah. If that's not a counter spell, he's thinking, oh, I've got this. Yeah, well, we know it's not a counter spell for sure. Mm hmm. Well, that's kind of awkward, the distribution and the, the oils. It's fine, that's lethal. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, so it didn't matter which way the oils went, it was still lethal. Unless it's ice block. Dun, dun, dun. So the rogue gets out of the way very cleanly. That was good. That was a really good game for Kalento. Um, we expected the rogue to be perhaps a little bit difficult to win with, but that game turned out a lot better than it could have, uh, assuming all we were assuming initially. So. Yeah, what we were assuming also when we were thinking about that is that uh, right. the mage was going to be freeze mage. Yeah. Which is way worse for rogue than tempo mage is. Because tempo mage is probably almost rogue favorite. It's like very close to 50 50, but yeah. Now, with the hunter less from ECOP, like we know the list, we know what it is. Um, it's got to go against Tiddler's Tempo Mage. You say it's a bit favored. Against Frozen Ice, it could be almost a coin flip, depending on who gets the really good curve early. Like who gets the one drop, um, who gets the two drop. Whoever gets the edge on those early turns, I like, can, can make a huge difference in the hunter mirror. So, yeah, we'll have one to of the see things how that goes. That makes a huge difference too is the amount of uh, one drops in the hunter mirror because. And the amount of unleashes and the amount of explosive traps. Because explosive traps really huge, unleash is really huge, obviously. But uh, one drops really are only good on turn one. And any time after that, it's going to be a really dead draw. The Hunter Mirror is like a pure aggression matchup where oftentimes you want to use all of your cards constantly. So if you get a one drop, then it's going to make your hand run out a lot quicker. It's going to force you to have to hero power more, which is yeah. surrendering tempo, which is really bad for you. So if you're running the list that's just like two abusives, Two Lepronomes, no Wargans, no like South Seas or anything weird, extra one drops. You're going to be favored in the Hunter Mirror by actually a decent margin because every time they hit those one drops that do literally no damage, you're hitting a card that's like a uh, quick shot, for example, or something that actually yeah. has impact towards winning the race. Yeah, no, I'm Trump surprised by that because I actually take the opposite school of thought where the more one drops you have in the Hunter versus Hunter matchup, the more favored you are. Kind of the same uh, philosophy as how face hunter is favored against mid range hunter. The more aggression you have, since it's a matchup all about aggression, the more favored you are to win the game. Uh, you just get blown out too much by explosive trap, too much by unleash. They, the odds are of them having explosive trap is like so incredibly high, and then you're gonna run out your hand too quick and uh, get burned out. The reason why the one drops are so effective against mid range hunter is because they have freezing trap and the. Having two you're negating those, yeah. Yeah, you just crush out the freezing trap, it does nothing for you. But when your entire board dies or you're forced to have to trade because they have the explosive trap up, it just slows you down so much that then the higher card quality starts to actually matter. Yeah. So if yeah, I guess we still don't actually know if ECOP is running explosive or freezing because we haven't seen a trap and uh, he could be running the hybrid type. 
Yeah, we sure. haven't seen a single trap from Ecop. Like we saw the Lothab, which seemed to be an indicator that was like a, a Lothab included in the Face Hunter based on the list that we saw. But if he's running snakes and freezings, maybe as alternatives, maybe no freeze, no explosives at all. Um, maybe we just missed the top end completely. It's possible. All right, we saw an explosive trap here from Ecop, so he is running those at the very least, and, and the freezing. Oh, freezing, and we also right. saw a pod shredder. So I'm going to just lay the money on two freezing and one explosive. And yeah. hybrid, it's and hybrid hunter typically only has one unleash the hounds, so that could definitely hurt him in the hunter mirror. So it's lucky for him that he has the mage to go up against. But this hand is god awful. <laughs> Double quick shot? You mean it's not good? I thought it was a great <laughs> hand. He's on this to go. Oh, oh, whoa! Ooh. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Oh, it's so bad right now. It could have been so sick. Imagine that mirror entity was here. That would have been a disgusting outcome. Yeah, still too bad at 4-3, though. Can't be sad about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until it I gets quick shot it. Uh, I'm just <laughs> freezing trap, probably. Uh, yeah, quick shot's fine, too. I mean, when is he gonna replay it for 5? It's just yeah, exactly. never gonna happen. But I guess it's gonna give him a free secret after the 5 drop, so in effect, it's still gonna be a 2-mana 4-3. Because then he gets a secret for... Like, the compensated mana cost of 3. Sure. Still just like really awkward to play and now like this isn't a minion that you really want a freezing trap. He's got explosive trap up though, so that's pretty sick for him. Well if he plays a mad scientist here, he risks not getting explosive trap val like uh, the explosive trap trigger and he might just waste the second trap to come out. Oh, but the second one is probably freezing, so I think he'll get it. Okay. Yeah, so you think he runs two freezing, one explosive? Instead of it's usually the, uh, how it's done, but you can get like any crazy mix with Hunter these days. Like it could yeah. be one 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 with Snake Trap. You'd run a snipe? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard about that. Well, I don't know. I think he might be under the assumption it's Face Hunter because of the match that uh, Ekop played earlier against Pro's Nice. So he might think that Ekop only runs Explosive Trap. It, does he run one freezing, one explosive? Because I've seen some people run one of each instead of anything That's else, right. and he didn't get one, so that means it. Oh, he didn't get one. one of each. Yeah. Whoa. One of okay. Each. So he's running two unleashes. Oh, we Maybe. don't know about how many unleashes, but. Yeah. I'd assume two unleashes. I mean, if you're gonna cut the second trap, of either or, you're probably gonna have to include. Do you re-include the Unleash? I mean, what did Ecop put in this deck? You know, I'm actually getting curious now. Here's, here's like... an interesting thing, though. Uh, Tiddler attacked that, and the trap didn't trigger, and then no trap came up, so he might be under the assumption that uh, after this trap goes off, the next trap that Ecop plays will be Explosive Trap. So double That's Explosive. True. That's right. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, I fully think that uh, Tiddler believes it's face under because I thought it was... Like extremely high possibility to be face hunter from the cards we saw in the previous match that I got played with this hunter deck. And never mind. Now the explosive trap is gonna protect the freezing from the mad scientist, so the freezing's not gonna go off unless he attacks the one two. The one two, yeah. But he might be afraid of snakes. So yeah, he's afraid of snakes, I guess. So he's not gonna be able to eat the freezing with the scientist, or he just really wants the secret. There's a possibility to just want the... Because, I mean, it, the the Hunter is kind of curving into his turn 5. So at worst mm -hmm. here, you might get, like, I guess... Yeah, that's yeah, going to get a really, sweet minion. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Getting that Scientist is much better to get that Mirror Entity to get than to get it uh, frozen trapped in this situation. And oh, the potential for crazy stuff is insane. Freezing Trap is problematic here. Uh, both those minions are cards you're not going to want to pay 7 or 6 for. The flame Cannon 50-50. That does nothing. Has lost 50-50. But he can try again. For the 33? Oh, no, he can try <laughs> no, again for the 50-50. Okay, yeah. yeah. I thought you meant, <laughs> let's just <laughs> roll the dice again. Hardcore mode. Alright. And 50-50? And he's not gonna try it. He's not gonna go for the big, but he's gonna get the images though. Oh, that's gonna hurt a little bit, but 
I think he's gonna. Well, actually, he loses the two mirror images. The hounds stay up, and then the two one dies. He's strong here. Oh, that is insane. Yeah. He's hoping it hits one of the hounds, right, so he can push through the images. Mm -hmm. And then kill off the two one, and then use the glaive to cut the four two. Whoa, yeah, that's an that's insane outcome. I mean, do you take the phase damage on the 4-2? I guess at this point your health doesn't matter yeah, too much, yeah. so there's like no reason to sacrifice the hounds. Yeah, the worst thing that happens is like a flame waker, and even then it's not that bad. I guess maybe he's going face with the Zuka? Why wouldn't he save the Shredder in case he could get a value trade with what pops out of the Shredder? Yeah, I mean, you could just go for face. That's fine as well. I don't know. Is he got playing Eagle Horn? And your opponent's at 21. Two and one. Two Glaive, Zuko, and Eagle Horn. Yeah, Could but when you're cutting a secret, do you cut the Eagle Horn as well? And find room for... Because I haven't seen, we haven't seen an Eagle Horn in two matches. I mean, obviously he could just not have drawn them. I'd find it very weird that he doesn't run at least one. But... Pretty yeah, good point. committed to the Smork here. Which is pretty good with this board. It seems really hard for his opponent to deal with. Whoa. Psycho! You just empty your hand in hero power, save the quick shot for next turn, then just go yeah. all face. He committed to it with the Glaivezuka swing last turn. If he doesn't go all face here, I'll be very surprised. If he trades with those boom bots, I don't know, like, this will be the most unusual line of play yeah. that I think I've ever seen. Yeah, the all face commitment last turn is going to work out really well, because if he went for board there, he could have actually been kind of punished by Dr. Bim, because, uh... Yeah, it gets a one good, like a few good boom bot hits, and maybe the game slips out of your hands. So yeah, exactly. He's got the taunt for Doctor Boom, but is it gonna be enough? He's gonna need some sick boom bot RNG too. That's pretty sick. Okay. That's pretty good. Let me check it out. That's not so good. Just maximizing the chance for him to get a minion. And then it hits face for one. <laughs> well, I think uh, oh, Tiddler man. can race though with this. Yeah, Tiddler could Fireball. win the next turn actually. There's a chance that. Oh, he's only he got wins. 17 damage. Right. He needs. Yeah. He's got 19 with the two fireballs, right? Well, actually, the kill command would do it. Second quick shot. Oh, he's already played one quick shot. Never mind. Well, I mean, he's. I thought he was going to taunt it then, but. Yeah. Oh, I right. Just... Taunted that one. Yeah, he's only gonna have one fireball. But yeah, I'm if he surprised he don't throw the. Uh, I don't think he likes the rusty horn very much. So here we need a bluegill warrior. Is there a two mana minion that can ever deal three damage? Right now, like, there's a bluegill for two, obviously. I don't think so. Direwolf Alpha wouldn't work here. Oh man. Flame Tank Totem doesn't quite work. Placement. If Tiddler clears one. the board, he may have one turn to live. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big hard if. Worse. Yeah. Uh, Flame Waker. Oh, does it that 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 kind of does it if he gets really really lucky hits, and I mean, out of this world lucky hits. Yeah, the but then he also has to kill the one the ones. Yeah, the creepers one ones are also going to be an issue. So you can cast two spells here, maybe an arcane missiles from the arcane intellect. That's not impossible, but you have to not play the mana worm. Yeah. If you play mana worm here, you're guaranteed not to wipe the board. Well, okay, that's game. You're not... Right? Oh, you guaranteed? Huh? Well, he can't possible. Well, I mean, I guess he'd have to kill the. I I don't know about that mana worm. Yeah, not yeah. It is impossible. I guess he needs to go for the double missile. Yeah. Yeah, he wouldn't have top taked it anyway, but Yeah. Wow, one good space. <laughs> nice Dude. job, Flame Waker. Gosh. What do you understand? Nice thing you know. Yeah, he definitely needed to find a missile there. <laughs> this has to be the absolute worst Flame Waker flame cannon combination I've ever seen. The these cards just don't understand what to do. Team Celestial doesn't look like they're getting on the board today. Wow, Team Celestial actually losing the fifth series in a row, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. That's so, right. 
They, they haven't that, been able to accumulate a single win. I mean, Cloud9 here getting away with a 6-4 score. Uh, I thought towards the end that maybe Team Celestial will be able to lock down the Rogue from Kalento and target it to the point where they, they just yeah. run away with it. But If it, that was Freeze Mage, which is like what everybody else is doing now, because everyone's... Yeah. Then uh, I think they were definitely heavily favored at that point and could have definitely just locked out the Rogue and won the series. But I don't think Temple Mage is a Tier 1 deck, so I don't understand its placement in their format. Like, their lineup, I don't understand what Temple Mage is doing, so we'd have to ask him about that, because, like, Temple Mage doesn't seem, like, that strong at locking anything out, really. It's such a okay-against-everything sort of deck. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a deck, I think, Tiddler, it's a comfortable pick. I think it's a comfort pick from Tiddler, who really likes the deck. He's brought it, you know, many places, doing pretty well with it, so he thought he'd bring it again today. Uh, I don't know whether or not Cloud9 played around that knowledge or not, uh, I almost doubt it, since they probably expected Freeze Mage, but, I mean, since they did bring Rogue and it didn't really have any amazing matchups, maybe they assumed it was going to be Tempo, in which case, the Rogue from Kalento makes a lot more sense. I mean, Rogue had amazing matchups in the beginning. There yeah, was the, the start. Priest and there was the Druid. The Druid, And yeah. uh, <laughs> they both got out, so that kind of pigeonholed the Rogue. But if those were still in it, then, like, the Rogue was just getting out. Free yeah. win, basically. All right, well, that's going to be it for the, the first uh, series of the day, Cloud9 versus Team Celestial. Team Celestial, unfortunately, accumulating another loss, but congratulations to Cloud9 for the win. That's going to push them a little further in the rankings. I think they're up 4-2 right now, unless I'm mistaken. 3-2, uh, sorry. Three My two. apologies. So they are 3-2, and it's, they're kind of still staying in the middle of the pack with everyone else. And at least Team Celestial, I guess, got wins. Now, I want to know, are they out officially? Like, Can they mathematically climb back in, or is it just impossible for them to get out of that 8th uh, eight, eight place? It's going to be tough. Uh, the best they can do is tie a team at this point with two wins if they win the next two and their tiebreakers are not very good because they haven't won one yet but uh, if the other team at two wins loses a lot in the next two weeks i think they still have a very outside chance all right well there's always a uh, you know a faint hope so they'll keep working now far bat i think you'll be leaving us after the next series so thanks for joining us for the casting trump will be back with myself um it was nice having you on the explanations were on point top notch Thanks. Yeah, it was pretty fun casting. Happy I yeah. could be here. <laughs> All right, well, guys, we'll be taking a short break, and we'll be back with the second series of the day. It's going to be Team Liquid versus Tempo Storm, uh, the two player, the two teams who haven't played yet this week. So we'll be taking a short three-minute break, and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere.